Hey, Bill. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Megan.
All right, let's go ahead and uh, get the day kicked off. Um, I know there's some folks that'll be kind of mingling in um, uh, here in just a few minutes, last minute cups, cups of coffee and things. But um, uh, welcome back to the Baker Institute. We had a great, great first day, really provocative uh, discussions, I think really highlighting uh, some of the complexities that, that we face as we think about this journey towards a, a lower carbon future. Um, I mentioned yesterday that action starts locally. And um, today we're going to kick off uh, uh, our discussions with something that is really in that in that theme. Um, really happy to uh, welcome Bobby Tudor up. Um, Bobby is the CEO of Art Artemis Energy Partners. He's a retired founder and CEO of Tudor Pickering and Holt. Um, prior to, to being at TPH, he was a partner with Goldman Sachs and has a 30-year career um, uh, under his belt uh, in investment banking really focused on energy and um, been involved in some of the largest energy deals um, uh, that have really shaped the, the global energy landscape as well as domestic energy landscape. Uh, he's currently the chairman of the Houston Energy Transition Initiative. Uh, it's an initiative at the Greater Houston Partnership, um, which is, I think, what he's going to focus on primarily in his remar remarks today. Um, it's a group that's working to define regional energy transition strategies, and it's a, it's a collaboration. Um, uh, across uh, industry and city government. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty remarkable effort. Um, he has a great connection with Rice. He's an alum. Um, he's actually a former uh, chairman of the Board of Trustees. Uh, he's on the board of the Baker Institute. Um, so, and he's actually on, a, on the boards of several charitable organizations locally. So um, I'm going to get out of the way and give the stage to Bobby. Bobby. Thank you, Ken. Um, it is always a great pleasure to be at Bryce and at the Baker Institute. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, uh, as someone who's living in this world every day, the Baker Institute is, is very highly regarded and widely respected in, in Austin and Washington, D.C., and in the corporate community uh, for being a, a really thoughtful, measured, and important contributor to the energy world, and in particular to the to this issue of, of energy transition. I have about uh, 15 slides or so that I'm gonna zip through uh, here, and I wanna leave a little bit of, of time at the end for questions, but before I do, I'll give you a, a bit of a context for all this, and Ken gave you a little bit. Um, the Greater Houston Partnership, uh, th think of it as the Chamber of Commerce for our region on steroids, uh, wh wh which is to say almost all of our large companies, and, and therefore, by definition, our large energy companies, are members of the Greater Houston Partnership. Their, uh, their CEOs are active uh, participants uh, in it. Uh, and uh, it really plays a, a very, very important role in the, in the economic um, development and, and future of our region. Uh, I was chairman of the board of the partnership in, in 2020. And sort of the, the perk uh, of being chairman is you get to choose an area of emphasis for your, your year of chairmanship. Uh, the chairman right before me was Scott McClellan. You might remember Scott, head of, he's the HEB guy. Scott chose public education as, as an area of, of, of uh, focus. Amy Cronus was the chair right after me. She runs Deloitte here. She chose technology broadly. Um, I chose the topic of the energy transition. And, and the reason I did was that I felt like it was, uh, it was a topic that wasn't being spoken about in polite company. Uh, in, in Houston, Texas in, in 2020. It was clearly, it clearly had huge implications for, for our region. Uh, and, and I felt like we really needed to be talking about it as, as a region in a way that, that we weren't. So, so uh, I took that on and gave a, and gave a big speech to, to the community about it in early 2020. And I would say it, it, hit, a, it hit a bit of a nerve in a good way. People said, yeah, you know, we do need to be talking about this. We do need to be engaged in it in, in a, a, as a region. Uh, and it, it really sort of uh, kicked off a bigger, broader, uh, uh, not just conversation, but, but uh, period of activity. And, and HETI was the outgrowth of all that. So HETI, Houston Energy Transition uh, Initiative. Um, 
You know, the way I framed the, the discussion was really primarily in, in economic terms. You know, one thing I like to say is that in, in Houston, Texas, one of the things we're good at is, is when we see a dollar lying on the ground, we tend to bend over and pick it up. And, and my, uh, my argument uh, was that with, without meaningful focus and change and um, participation, uh, in the energy transition, Houston was not likely to be nearly the same growth engine and area of prosperity in the next 20 years that it has been in the past 20 years. And the reason for that uh, is, is quite simple. Um, we've got a very mature fossil fuel industry that is highly unlikely to have the same growth characteristics in the next 20 years that we've had in the past 20 years, and we need to look, be looking for other places for, for growth. This slide suggests um, kind of four key thoughts for, for today's uh, conversation. The first is, in some sense, obvious, and I'll give you a few statistics around it, but that Houston, Texas is, in fact, the energy capital of the world. And more importantly, we are highly, highly leveraged to the incumbent oil and gas business, more so than almost any other region in the world. You could think about Detroit for autos or maybe Los Angeles for, uh, for um, the entertainment industry or New York for finance. But none of those would have 40% of their total jobs actually tied to the incumbent industry in, in the way that we do here. So this has very, very big implications for us. And given what's happening in that industry, this transition creates new challenges uh, for us in Houston. These are challenges that we need to take on, and we need to take them on quite uh, directly. In particular, um, we want to come out on the back end of this, which is to say 20 or 25 years from now, um, and still be the energy capital of the world. Well, it, unless we do some things differently, that's highly unlikely uh, to, to, be, to be the case. Um, we do think we can win this, uh, and, and in many ways, we're starting from a great place, uh, actually, and, and I'll tell you why I think we're starting from, from a great place. In some ways, we aren't starting from such a great place. Um, but we have every reason to win, uh, actually, and I'm confident that at the end of the day, Houston can lead the world to an energy abundant and low carbon future. A few statistics. We have 24 Fortune 500 companies uh, in Houston. 18 are, for the are from the incumbent oil and gas, broadly defined petrochemical world. 18 out of 24. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you hear people say, well, Houston has done a great job of, of uh, diversifying its economy over the course of the past 20 years, I think that's nonsense, actually. We, we haven't done that. When, it, when, when, I, when I think about what Houston looked like when I moved here as a young investment banker uh, in, the, in the early 1990s, um, we had American General and Compaq Computer and Cooper Industries and Browning Ferris and, you know, a, a, a much higher percentage of our Fortune 500 companies were actually non-energy companies than, than they are today. We are highly concentrated in this sector. Out of 128 publicly traded oil and gas E&P firms, uh, nationally, 44 of those are actually headquartered here, and, and the vast majority of them, if they're not headquartered here, have very large presences here. Um, about 14 percent of total oil refining uh, capacity uh, in America is in our metropolitan area, and if you expand our metropolitan area to think about it as basically, you know, Beaumont, Port Arthur down to Corpus Christi, which is sort of how we think about the Gulf Coast region, it's over 25 percent of total U.S. refining capacity. 44% of total base petrochem manufacturing capacity with 591 chemical manufacturing establishments here. It's just an incredible, incredible concentration of assets. There's nothing like this anywhere in the world. We had, we had uh, meetings recently with the folks from Rotterdam who, who were here in Houston to talk about issues like this and energy transition issues. And, and they are, in some sense, they're kind of the Houston ship channel of Northern Europe. Uh, but they don't have concentration that looks anything, anything like this. So the point is, we are highly, highly concentrated uh, in the incumbent uh, industry. This is our employment by sector. And over the, the bottom line here is that over 40% of total jobs in our region, in our, in our uh, 11 county region, 40% are either direct to the incumbent energy world or indirect to the incumbent energy world. So what's an indirect job? Well, an indirect job is someone like me, an investment banker who serves the energy world, or a lawyer who serves the energy world, or, or the guy that runs the Subway sandwich shop at, at uh, ConocoPhillips. 
He thinks he's in the sandwich business. In fact, he's in the oil and gas business, uh, actually. So the, the point here is that there's, there's just a lot of concentration in, in our jobs uh, in, in, uh, in the energy world. Well, uh, that was actually quite a good thing because for quite a long time, Houston was the fastest growing major metro in America from 2008 to 2018 by a very long shot. Second was Dallas, actually. So while all of America was reeling on the heels of, of the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, Houston was booming. And Texas was booming in general. Why? Because of the shale revolution, right? We went from 5 million barrels of oil production in the United States to almost 13 million barrels of oil production over, over that period of time. And Houston was the great beneficiary uh, of that. So we saw a lot of job growth and job expansion uh, over, over that period of time. But what's interesting here is that if you look back to 2014, when we were producing uh, about 9 million barrels, I want to say, something like that, in, 20, in 2014, and you bring it forward to 2020, when we were producing almost 13 million barrels, our, our energy-related employment went down 14%. 14% during a period where we were still growing production and growing production, actually, uh, quite quite aggressively. Why? Because of efficiencies. You just get better at doing things, <laughs> right? The frack crew that used to need nine people now, now needs two people. There's digitization, there's robotics, there's all the things that are happening across uh, American industry have been happening in the oil and gas business uh, as well. So we just got better at doing more with less people and, and we think that that will continue to be the case. What, what's different is that it's going to continue to be the case in a world of flattening to ultimately declining fossil fuel demand. Now, I, I'm of the school that says, um, I think we're still likely to have global demand growth in oil through 2030. There's a lot of argument about that. There are people saying, mm, I think by 28, we're going to be flat to going down. I think there's a plausible case around that. There are others who say, no, because what's going on in the developing world, we're likely to grow until 2032 or even 2035. But if you think about it, in the overall scheme of things, that's a relatively tight band, <laughs> right? No one is really arguing that past about 2035, we're going to continue to see global oil demand growth. Natural gas, we probably have a bit of a longer runway, uh, actually, but not a hugely longer runway in, in, in natural gas. So these, these numbers are from McKinsey. And what they suggest is that over this period of time, we do expect total energy consumption globally to grow by about 14%. The role of electricity, in particular of renewables, of course, uh, we expect to, to really grow in importance and actually to double from about 20% to 40%. And we would expect to have continued reductions in the energy intensity of GDP as a, as a key driver uh, of all of this. But for oil and natural gas, and, and obviously for coal as well, what that means is we're going to peak demand and start to decline. Um, and for us in Houston, what that, what that means is that it's highly unlikely that that great engine for growth that we had from 2008 to 2018 is likely to be the same going forward for the next, for the next decade or so. Um, look, these are the kind of things that we've been talking about here at the, at the Baker Institute over, over the course of the past uh, uh, two days, and none of them, I think, are, are particularly uh, uh, surprising. But all of them have very large implications for the, for the energy world. And look, I would be the first to say predicting what's going to happen in the energy macro is in and of itself uh, extraordinarily difficult, uh, right? My, my old partner, uh, Dan Pickering, used to say that anyone at the firm caught saying it's different this time is fired on the spot. The, the energy business is a highly cyclical business. Uh, I think it continues to be a highly cyclical business. You know, right now, the, there's, there's, you know, everyone's saying, oh, we're, we're in a super cycle for commodity prices. You know, now's a great time to invest. Let's go. And I'm like, yeah, I've heard that before, uh, actually. Uh, and, and then others would have, have said a couple of years ago when we were at very low prices, this is the future of the fossil fuel business. You know, this is a sign. It's over. These assets are stranded. Well, that wasn't true either. Right? We, we have cycles in the commodity business. We're going to continue to have cycles in the commodity business. And, and, and arguably, they will be more volatile cycles uh, with, with, with greater spikes. But, but it's just something we have to continue to, to live with. I think what is very clear is that there is a need to provide affordable, reliable, 
and resilient energy abundance at scale. Uh, that's, it is critical to the world. What's happened, obviously, in Europe in the last six months reminds us that um, of that. But it's also critical that we need to dramatically lower carbon emissions. There's, there, there's very little argument uh, about that anymore, and that's a good and healthy thing from, from my perspective. So the question becomes, well, uh, you know, what role is Houston going to play in all that, and are we going to be the leader uh, for the next 20 years that we've been for the last 20 years? So uh, I say, well, we need to be. Let's talk about how we're going to do it. So this is, this is HETI, the Houston Energy Transition Initiative at the, at the partnership. Uh, we have a steering committee of, of 20 or so members. They're on the right-hand side of this page, and they, they represent a cross-section of integrated oil companies, independents, oil field services companies, power business, renewable companies, uh, engineering and construction companies, et cetera. Every one of these companies is, is focused on the, the role that they, uh, they will play um, over the course of the next 20 years in this energy transition. They're highly engaged in it. It's something that the CEOs of every one of these companies wake up in the morning thinking about and, and trying to focus on. Now, one of the things that's been very clear to us um, in, in all of this work is that every company comes at this from a slightly different perspective, right? It depends on, on what your core competencies are. It depends on what your shareholders want. It depends on how you're capitalized, right? It, 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 depends, uh, it, it depends on where you think you can make a difference and, and where you can't. So, so we certainly have no expectation that every incumbent energy company is going to think about this in the same way. And in fact, given that we have this dual challenge of continuing to provide <laughs> reliable, affordable uh, energy today while simultaneously driving down uh, emissions, we need companies that are focused on the former, which is very effectively delivering fossil fuel uh, for energy consumption uh, to, to the world, just doing it in a cleaner way. And we have a lot of companies who are doing that. On the other hand, we need companies also who are using their expertise to lean into new things uh, and in some cases uh, pivot their, their business model. And we need the emergence of totally new companies uh, to, uh, to really provide that, uh, you know, innovation uh, spark that is really, really critical to industrial, industrial transformation. We have working groups in carbon capture, US, uh, carbon capture use and storage, the decarbonization of industrial assets, all things hydrogen related, and then what we call capital funding and structure. Um, we, we have broad-based support from McKinsey on all this, uh, and we have on the whole, I don't know, 250 companies or something like that. Engaged, engaged in this uh, this work. Scott Nyquist, who's here somewhere, I think I saw Scott. Scott's Scott's one of my two vice chairs, along with Eric, Eric Mullins and Jane Stricker is our executive director. Some of you may know Jane. She was at BP, uh, was the the um, primary in some sense unacknowledged author of the um, uh, of the NPC uh, study on carbon capture, use, and storage. That's become a really important source document for everyone working in that in that space. So what are we doing uh, as, as a group? Well, we're really working across three domains. One is we want to jumpstart uh, the emerging sectors where we believe Houston has a distinct advantage, and they are all things CCUS, all things hydrogen, the circular economy or, or plastics, end-to-end uh, -end plastics recycling because of our big petrochem industry, and then battery manufacturing and, and all things related to energy storage. Why, why did we pick these? Well, the answer is um, we, we are advantaged uh, in, in these, right? There, there's a reason that ExxonMobil and that other group of 14 companies decided that they wanted to do the, lar the world's largest CCUS project, a $100 billion project on the Houston Ship Channel. Good news, bad news, we have a high concentration of high-end emitters <laughs> uh, in, in one place, but we also have good geology and we have good infrastructure and, and uh, we have supportive policy of making a project like that uh, work. Hydrogen. Over 60 percent of hydrogen dedicated pipelines in the U.S. are in metropolitan Houston, Texas. 60 percent. Think about that, right? I, I made a trip to Boston and met with some folks at, at MIT who were working on a whiz-bang new electrolyzer, and I was chatting with the guy who was, who was starting the company. I said, well, if, you know, how, how are you going to get this hydrogen moved around? And he said, what do you mean moved around? I said, well, if you're not consuming it where you're producing it, you're actually going to have to move it. He said, well, yeah, we'll get to that. And I said, well, let me ask you this. Do you think you'll ever be able to build a hydrogen pipeline uh, between New York and Boston? 
He said, oh, no, no way could we ever build. I said, well, you probably need to move this company to Houston, Texas, because we actually can do that in, in Houston, Texas, and we will do that in, in, in Houston, Texas. Secondly, we want to attract and support company, companies in what we call established new energy industries. So that's all things renewable, the solar and, and wind business being uh, two obvious ones. It's also the, the whole RNG, or renewable natural gas space, what we call low carbon LNG uh, and, and biofuels. Big projects happening in all of these things uh, on the Gulf Coast. Uh, a, a lot of startup companies associated with the, these four are, are now based here. Uh, and even the companies who aren't based here have presences here because our region is really, really important in all four of, of, these, of these spaces. And then finally, we want to deploy cross-cutting initiatives to attract and grow companies in all energy value chains, and we, we've listed some of those uh, here on the lower right. Advanced materials is, is a good example of, of where we in Houston feel like we have a built-in advantage. Uh, advanced materials are mainly about chemistry, <laughs> right? We have more chemical engineers and more PhD chemists per capita in our region than any place in America by a long shot, right? The Welch Institute, many of you know about that if you're affiliated with Rice, in, with, with Rice uh, a, a newly formed institute <clears throat> based on a, a very large gift from the Welch Foundation uh, to create a new center focused on advanced materials uh, at Rice. Very, very exciting stuff. Advanced materials are really, really big part ultimately of all things energy transition, and it's a space where we uh, we can and, and and will lead. But that is also true in geothermal. Some of you may have seen the Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm was here a couple of weeks ago to talk specifically about geothermal. Geothermal is simply taking the skill sets that exist in the current upstream, you know, oil and gas business and turning it into uh, uh, turning into a, a new source of of energy, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a ton going on here in this regard. And we're very excited <clears throat> about all of that. So this is a, you know, this is a bit of a, a map of, of what's happened here over the course of the past couple of years. I, I'm not going to go through all this, but I think suffice it to say, um, when, when I made my speech in, in early 2020, I said it was really, really critical that the rest of the world uh, cease seeing Houston as an impediment to the energy transition, and instead, see Houston as a partner in the energy transition. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think part of, part of our history around that was well earned. <laughs> uh, and part of it, you know, part of it was not. But uh, at the end of the day, the, the energy transition at scale is not going to happen unless the incumbent industry has its shoulder behind the wheel and is making a difference uh, in the in the transition, and I'm very happy to say that 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 increasingly uh, that is that is the case. Um, Greentown Labs, a lot of you know about Greentown Labs. It's the it's the climate tech accelerator that now has a presence in Houston. The Greater Houston Partnership was really critical in, in recruiting Emily Reichert and Greentown Labs to to Houston. It's a Somerville, Mass. Uh, headquartered company, and they they started their second their second um, facility in, in Houston just a year ago. It took them six years to get to 60 startups in Somerville, Mass, related to climate tech. In Houston, it took one year. We've got 70 companies now at Greentown Labs uh, work, working on this. Very, very exciting stuff sort of uh, across the board, uh, if, if you will. Uh, a few other words about our kind of innovation ecosystem. This is a, it used to make me crazy. And I, I'd hear people, uh, I'd hear people say, you know, Houston's just terrible for startups. You know, it's just not a good kind of innovation economy. I'm like, what do, you, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> startups have have long been a really, really critical component of the energy eco ecosystem in Houston. I would argue we're better at that than any other any other place in the world. What they meant really was, well, it's not great startups for software companies, it's not great, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and there's some, there's some truth to that. And, and um, what we have found is that we need to, you know, leverage the expertise that is here uh, to be supportive of, of startups in the, in the clean tech uh, space and, and climate tech space generally. We have a lot of momentum around that right now. Just last week here at, at Rice, uh, Brad Burke and the Rice Alliance, which is part of the Jones School of Business at Rice, sponsored a, 
sponsored an energy technology conference. We had 90 companies from around the world here, about half of which were Houston-based companies. We had venture capitalists from all over. It was really, really impressive. I don't believe there's, I don't believe San Francisco could pull that off in, in the energy technology space. I don't believe Boston could pull it off. I don't believe Chicago could pull it off. It, it's happening here because this is where the expertise is. This is where the customers are. This is where at the end of the day, understanding of energy markets uh, res resides. And our, uh, our innovation community is really just uh, exploding. There, there's a ton happening. I will also say that our universities are really, really central to that. And so one of the things that we're, we're working hard at, at at the partnership is getting better connectivity between our universities and our corporate players. And that's whether it's in R&D or in policy uh, or in entrepreneurship and innovation and, and all of that. But, but Rice and A&M and, a &M and UT and U of H and Prairie View and, and TSU all, all have things to add uh, in that regard, and we need to make sure that it's, that it's happening. We also really need to ramp up um, R&D in, in this space. Uh, and if you talk to Reggie DeRoche, our president here at Rice, or, or John Sharp at A&M, at, at a or, or uh, the chancellor at UT, everyone, everyone views this as a priority. Everyone views this as a place where we can make a difference, specifically uh, in, uh, in, in, in this space, uh, and there are great ambitions in that regard. Uh, one of the things that we're working on right now is a big NSF engines grant to, to, make, uh, to make our region a really, really uh, important hub here. Uh, and, and to win a big NSF engines grant, what you have to do is you have to bring together the corporate community and the academic community and the philanthropic community and, and the government community uh, to work together. We are good at that here. We actually are really good at that uh, in greater Houston, Texas, and, um, and those are the kind of things that, that we ultimately uh, need, to, need to make happen. Um, in addition to these kind of three domains that we're working in, we have, uh, you know, we have this sort of portfolio approach, if you will. I'm a big believer that, you know, the IEA says we need to be spending about $5 trillion a year to meet the goals associated with Paris, a year, globally, on this problem. We're currently spending about a trillion. So $5 trillion a year for 30 years is a lot of money, all right? You heard Rob Kaplan say yesterday, I think the GDP of the U.S. is about $20 trillion or something, $23 trillion GDP of the U.S. We're talking about $150 trillion over time. I personally don't know where that money is going to come from. So therefore, it seems pretty clear to me that unless we are able to work within our current infrastructure and our current systems, we're highly, highly unlike to get, unlikely to get to where we need to be on global carbon emissions, at least on the time frame that's, that's gonna, gonna make a difference. Therefore, I'm a big believer in CCUS, for example, as a, as a really important piece of the puzzle. But it's not the only piece of the puzzle. Uh, and you know, core, everything from core R&D to, uh, to a, a, a cleaner, uh, um, a cleaner hydrogen-based fuel source, you name it. There are a million different things here that can make a difference, and we need to be working on, on all of them. That's what we're doing at the partnership, uh, and we also need to make sure that Houston is a capital center for, for all of this. You know, one of the things that happened in the shale revolution is that the sources of capital for that basically moved from New York City <laughs> to Houston, Texas. And they moved here because this is where the action was, right? If you wanted a good management team and, and you wanted you know, the best new uh, idea, you needed to be here. We need that same thing to be true for, for investing in the energy transition. The good news is we're starting from a good spot because a lot of those funds now uh, are, are focused on this space. They're already here. We're also seeing, um, we're also seeing the emergence of, of new energy tech-oriented venture capital funds here in, in Houston, but the whole issue of money is a, is a big issue. And so not only do we need money <laughs> to fund this transition, we also need money to fund the extant oil and gas business so that we can continue <laughs> to provide reliable and affordable energy to everyone who needs it today. And guess what? That requires capital, and it requires a lot of capital. And I think the world is seeing at the moment what happens if you underinvest in this business for two and three and four years at a time, you're highly likely to see meaningfully higher prices. And as Rob Kaplan said yesterday, who bears the brunt of that? 
where moderate and low-income people uh, bear, bear the brunt of that. So uh, this, this, is a, this is a big, difficult, complicated uh, problem, but it's one that is highly unlikely to get solved unless we here in Houston are right in the middle of that, and that is what we intend to be. Um, these are some of our cross-cutting initiatives. I mentioned the NSF engines uh, process. Um, climate equity and, and, and justice around all this is a, really, uh, is a really, really important issue. Rob touched on a piece of that yesterday, which is just the effect of higher energy prices on, on low-income uh, people. There are also issues uh, around uh, you know, neighborhoods sited immediately adjacent to petrochemical plants. There are also issues uh, that are, are quite different if you're living in Africa. I, I spoke at the, the Houston Africa Energy Summit last week, and they have a very, very different view uh, around this issue than we do here in, in North America, where hundreds of millions of people have no access to energy, live in complete energy poverty. Well, their perspective is, wait a minute, you know, you're, you're telling me we need to wait until fossil fuel, and until renewables are competitive on price to get electricity to my people. I'm not waiting on that. No, no way, right? And so, and, and they say, and by the way, the whole continent of Africa is responsible for 3% of total global emissions. 3%, like it's nothing. Why don't you guys go solve your problem and worry about us later, right? Uh, so this, this whole area of, of economic justice is a, is a really kind of tricky uh, and, and important uh, area, and we're focused on that uh, as, as well. We uh, finally, kind of communication and branding. Uh, those of us who've been in Houston a long time know that we have a bit of a chip of, on our shoulder around this whole issue. We're never appreciated for the great place that we really are, you know by the rest of the country. I think that's particularly true in this space, uh, uh, frankly. And one of the things we need to do is, is be, be very clear about our commitment to being a partner in solving what, do, what is a, a massive fundamental uh, problem, but also be very clear that we view it as a dual challenge. And it's a dual challenge of continuing to apply, uh, su supply reliable and affordable energy today while simultaneously driving down global, emiss uh, gl global emissions um, uh, uh, dra drastically. We need the world to understand that. Uh, I think the world is understanding that, actually. I think we're in a very different place today than we were just two years ago uh, in Greater Houston, but we still have quite a long way to go uh, in that regard. Um, we do have proof points. A lot of great stuff has happened. I've mentioned uh, some of it uh, already, but we have a very, very long way to go. This is a, this is a marathon, not a, a sprint. It, it has great urgency, but it's also going to take a long time. Um, and, and, but it is not going to happen without us. I think that's, that's one thing that's very clear. I think the world is kind of getting that, the idea that we, we are going to kind of isolate that evil fossil fuel industry that's been selling cigarettes to children, you know, for the past 50 years, and, and we're just gonna we're gonna innovate them out of business. I think that that notion has fundamentally shifted, actually, to huh, you know, we need them if we're going to make the kind of progress uh, that that we need to make on on the issue of climate change and and lowering global global emissions. So I think the good news is the conversation around all that is healthier today than it was two years ago or four years ago. Uh, we need that to continue to be the case, and institutions like the Baker Institute play a really, really important role uh, in that. So what is, what is success for us? Success is, is being the energy capital of the world 20 years from now, and, and having job growth and economic prosperity, uh, while at the same time being major, major contributors to, to solving this massive problem that the world face, faces around climate change and, and lowering uh, emissions. Um, we think we're on the right track. I'm sure the track will change over time. I'm sure we're going to make mistakes as we go. We're making mistakes today, I, I know. But we're working it. That's the important thing. We're working it, and we're working it very hard, and we're working it uh, in partnership with our companies uh, here, with our academic institutions, with our philanthropists, uh, with, our, with our local and state governments and national governments. And, um, and that's what we can do, and, and it's what we should continue to do. So there you have it. I don't know if we have any time left for questions at all, Ken, uh, but I'm happy to take some. Thank you, Bobby. That's actually a great way to get the day started. And, and given the time, I'm going to actually ask two questions that I have a feeling will run through pretty much anything anybody would send up here. 
that was reasonable anyway. So um, <laughs> what, I will, what I will first ask you is you laid out a lot of sort of aspiration and highlighted why it's feasible in this region. What would you say are the biggest challenges that we face regionally to achieving those aspirations? Well, some of it is policy, right? So, so for example, um, to get a hundred billion dollar CCUS project done uh, in the in the Houston Ship Channel, uh, we're going to need a lot of help, both from the federal government, the state government, and from the local government to to make that happen. Now, a good step has been taken. The new uh, the, the, the change in government subsidy for CCUS projects from $45 a ton to up to $85 a ton uh, makes a lot of these projects economic in a way that they weren't before. But you still got to get right of waves built for, for CO2 pipelines, you know, to get to, uh, to get to storage areas. And then you still have to have a legal framework in place that, that talks about the liability associated with, with, with storing the CO2 underground. There's, there's just a lot that needs to happen around that uh, for, for this, to, for, for this to, to, to work. We, need, we, we also need uh, ongoing investment and dramatically higher investment, I would, I would argue, in fundamental research associated with, uh, with basic materials. Uh, and with uh, a whole range of issues associated with, with the energy transition. In my mind, that's a great place for, for the federal government to spend their dollars, frankly, uh, and, and leveraging off the university system that exists in this country in a way that it doesn't exist almost any, anywhere else uh, in, in the world. So we need, we need a lot more of, of that. We, we do need our, our energy companies allocating capital to this. Right now, not every ener energy company can allocate capital to this, but a lot, a lot can, and, and many, and many are. But I would point out that there's this, there's this kind of broad perception that says, well, look, if Exxon Mobil and Chevron and Shell and you know Total, if the if the big oil companies would just move their capital to this and do the right thing, then it's a problem that could be solved. That's just not the case, right? The the, the total annual capex budget for the seven or so largest oil companies in the world is only about $100 billion. Even if they allocated 100% of their capital to this, right, it would be a drop in the bucket relative to what is needed <laughs> uh, and, and capital uh, over time. So finding ways uh, to, uh, to bring more capital in the system is, is really, really important. I think what goes unsaid too much and probably needs to be said is that if we're going to do this quickly in a way that, that, is, um, that really does address the immediate needs of climate change, it's going to cost all of us more. And no one wants to acknowledge that. And when I say all of us, I mean taxpayers, I mean energy consumers, I mean everybody, right? <clears throat> and therein lies the rub, right? People say they want it, right? Are they really willing to pay more for it? Uh, and, and so therefore, continuing to drive down the cost curve and make these technologies uh, more, uh, more sort of economically competitive is really, really important to ultimately getting adoption at scale. So the, the last question I'll ask is related to environmental justice and social justice. Um, and I want you to specifically focus on the efforts of the Greater Houston Partnership and, and your partners. Yeah. Uh, regionally, because you, you just mentioned the need for infrastructure, right. the need for change in permitting rules, the need for all sorts of incentives. How does that actually juxtapose against concerns about local communities? Well, it means they have to be partners in the conversation, right? right? So the, the days of you know, Chevron and ExxonMobil and Shell uh, putting together a project, uh, getting funding, uh, getting permitting and putting shovels in the ground without ever having a conversation with with local groups <laughs> uh, I think those days are over and I think those companies absolutely know that and uh, and agree with it um, and so having a having a uh, kind of conversation if you will uh, that is a lot more inclusive than has historically been the case in, in this country as is really really critical now all that being said the big one of the big in, uh, one of the big enemies of the energy transition is NIMBYism in general, right? And and talk to folks who try to get new transmission lines built from 
you know, solar farms in the middle part of the country to where, or, or, or uh, wind farms to where the, uh, the electricity needs to be, um, it's difficult, right? And, 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 you know, you'll notice that, uh, that Senator Manchin's um, part of the, the, the recent bill around permitting got pulled uh, and, and is no longer part of it. So this issue of permitting is a, is a really big problem. And the, and the truth is, a lot of times, Local, local groups just don't want that uh, disruption to their life. They, they don't, right? And so, um, and so therefore, projects don't get built. <laughs> uh, so it, when I say it's gonna take all of us, I really mean it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take a much more inclusive uh, approach from the companies involved, and it's also gonna take uh, local communities of all sorts leaning in and saying, we, we understand that we need to make sacrifices too. Uh, and, and you know, that's, that's, a hard, that's a hard thing to do. Uh, but it's not gonna get done without that. And, and the companies know it, and certainly we at the partnership know it. Our local government officials know it at the county and city level and at the state level. And we all have to work together to, to make so it happen. Just to follow up on that, can you comment on the activities of GHP in that space? Like, I know you've been, you know, working with, uh, you know, county officials, yes. city officials, just <clears throat> some of the things. That right. So, so for example, um, the, the Center for Houston Future is kind of, is, is kind of leading the charge on all things hydrogen uh, for, for us. And they have, they have a group of, I don't know, it's something like 120 entities focused on uh, this issue of Houston as a, as a hydrogen hub. Those entities include <laughs> neighborhood groups and local government groups and et cetera. So they're at, they're at the table with Air Liquide <laughs> uh, and, and uh, you know, the big producers and, and consumers of, of hydrogen as well. We've, we've just put together an advisory board uh, for us at, at Hedy that that has uh, representatives from the environmental community, from, from the local government, uh, from neighborhood groups, um, and, and we're very clear that we need broad input. You know, just having 20 big energy companies around the table deciding the way it's gonna be, those days are over. Not, uh, maybe those days never existed, but if they did, they're over, <laughs> right? Uh, and the companies know that, and, and we're certainly taking a much more inclusive approach around that. Right, so basically it's going to take everybody. It's going to take everybody. Absolutely. Well, uh, everybody join me in thanking Bobby for coming time this week. So I'm going to invite um, the next uh, group of speakers up to the stage with me. So we're going to jump right into um, the next panel discussion. Um, I'm really pleased to have up here with me a, a fantastic group of, of speakers. Uh, the focus of this discussion is really the juxtaposition of pragmatism and aspiration. Uh, sort of how do we actually get things done? Um, and uh, I'll just briefly introduce uh, uh, my, my, the, the speakers that I have up on stage with me. Um, immediately uh, uh, to, um, to my left is Erin Bowser. She is the Executive Vice President of Project Management at EDP Renewables. Um, and then uh, we have Ara Cuellar. Um, she is the Vice President of Energy Transitions at Shell. Uh, Davil Shah, who's the Director of, um, our General Manager, I'm sorry, of Technology and Innovation at SABIC. Uh, and then all the way at the end of the stage down there is Vijay Swarup. He's the Director of Technology at ExxonMobil. Um, before I turn to them, I just want to make a couple of comments that I think will kind of help frame the remarks that you're going to hear and, and ultimately the Q&A that we get into. And um, I do want to encourage you, if you have a question, um, even if it's at top of mind now, write it down and, and you know, make sure it, it gets sent up here to me uh, at the stage because um, I want this to be an inclusive conversation. I think the more you guys are involved, the better. Um, we heard a couple of times actually over the course of this, this event that the scale of what we're endeavoring to do is absolutely massive and in, in a lot of ways misunderstood. 
Uh, it's funny because when you talk about things in um, billions or trillions, it, it, it sort of becomes not real in many ways and hard to connect to. Um, but that is a major issue that we face when we talk about transitioning an energy system as large as the global energy system is today to one that is more sustainable, lower carbon, et cetera. So hopefully, I think what we're going to get out of this discussion is, is really the degree of complexity that we face in, in endeavoring to do that, but also a better understanding of what that scale looks like. Um, and how different actors along the energy value chain, because that's exactly what we have up here, um, are approaching this. Um, you know, Bobby, I think, said it very nicely. It's going to take everybody. Um, and when he says everybody, that includes all of the different actors along the energy value chain and across the energy landscape. So um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Now, as I kind of move um, from my left to right, uh, or my left across the stage, um, uh, I'm going to ask each of you to just briefly um, uh, introduce yourselves a little bit more deeply than I have. Uh, their bios are available uh, online if you're, if you're curious. Um, you can look those up. Um, but hopefully what they're going to do is make some opening remarks about this, this, this subject, but also connect themselves. So why are they up here on stage? Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go in order across. We actually have a different order I'm going to go. I'm going to ask Aaron to go first. Then I'm going to call him VJ, then Davil, then Ara. So Aaron, please. Super. Thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. So Aaron Bowser, Executive Vice President of Project Management at EDP Renewables North America. So EDP Renewables North America is a wholly owned subsidiary of EDP Renewables that is based in 28 markets across the world, including across North America, South America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. We're the fourth largest owner and operator of renewable assets in the world. And here in the United States, EDP Renewables North America is also the fourth largest developer owner operator of renewable assets in the country. Um, that includes over eight gigawatts of wind and solar. Traditionally, over the last decade or so, we've been predominantly a developer owner and operator of wind farms, utility scale wind across the United States. Over the last couple of years, like everyone else, we're striving to diversify. So we are doing far more solar. We are working in storage, distributed generation, and hydrogen. Like everyone else, we are working uh, very quickly to try and scale both the number of installed megawatts that we put into the ground each year, also scale our business. We are hiring like crazy um, and trying to uh, find, you know, the next workforce that can help us to accomplish our goals. Some of the challenges, um, there are many. Uh, I feel a little bit, um, bef before I started at EDP Renewables, I spent 10 years in policy trying to advocate for policies that would bring clean energy to the forefront, both at the federal level and at the state level. So I spent the first 10 years of my career doing that. I've spent the next 14 years actually building projects. Now we are at a major turning point. And that turning point is happening um, because we need to do it. The passage of the Inflation Reduction Act is a game changer for the industry and, and probably, you know, not just the industry but for our whole country. And at the same time, we face a lot of challenges. So. There are significant challenges and there are major opportunities. And so the, the title of this panel is very fitting because it kind of describes my day. Um, you know, how do you deal with the challenges of inflation, uh, volatility, the labor market, you know, finding enough people, um, costs going up for everything, while at the same time making sure that you don't lose track of the significant opportunities in front of us. And so you, you can't spend your whole day solving problems. You also have to spend part of your day thinking big, being innovative, you know, reaching across the table to other sectors and other industries and how can we work together because as the previous speakers have said, we will, we will need to do that. So um, I'm really more interested in um, the questions that people have, so I'm, I'm going to stop there um, and pass it to my next panelist. VJ. Okay. 
Well, let's first, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It is absolutely an honor to be here. Um, actually, it's an honor to be anywhere. I mean, there's people in the audience. I mean, this is fantastic, a three-dimensional conference. I haven't done this in a while. Uh, but it really is an honor to be up here and to share the table with, uh, with this group is, is incredibly humbling. If you listen to, to, Bobby gave a great speech. And if you counted the number of times he said and versus the number of times he said or, it was almost 100 to zero. This is an and problem, as you said. Energy is incredibly complex. And if I think about it, now, I'll tell you a little bit myself to begin. I have 35 years with ExxonMobil, um, split between research jobs, technology jobs, and business jobs. The last nine years, I was the leader of the R&D organization, which was developing a lot of the technologies that I'll talk about in, in a moment. And then about six months, I moved into the, into the director role in our corporate offices in Dallas. Uh, if you'd have asked me 35 years ago on a sheet of paper to say, how are you going to do energy in 2022, back in 87? I'd have gotten a really bad grade. Uh, and the reason is because I didn't anticipate the technology. That's the wild card. The things we do today to discover, deploy, and use energy were unimaginable back in 87, underpinned by adjacent technologies like computing, like material science. You think about energy, it is the integration of every engineering and every science discipline. I don't know of another industry that can say that. We need every type of engineer, chemical, electrical, uh, civil, nuclear, and we need every science, chemistry, biology, every ology out there, all to come together. And that's quite humbling. And it talks about how we have to integrate. And it is a lot about technology at scales that are unimaginable. On a PowerPoint slide, it looks like a y-x axis. Those axes were trillions of joules, hundreds and thousands of megajoules. These are really, really big numbers. And I say all that, essentially everything in this room came from some form of a energy source or a hydrocarbon source. And I say all that with great humility because there's about a billion people out there that don't even know what we're talking about, that don't have access to energy, that don't have access to cooking fuel, that don't have access to polyester, which some of us might be wearing. Many of you in the audience probably not, but some of us are. <laughs> uh, and, that's, and that's the challenge we have. And so how do we go from where we are today to where we want to go? So it's not uh, pragmatism versus aspiration. It's pragmatism and aspiration. We have to keep supplying energy today. That's critically important. And we have to do it in ways that lower the carbon intensity, lower the emissions intensity of the energy that we are all counting on for the quality of our lives. But then we have to build a bridge to where we want to go. Now, my, our, our thesis, my thesis is that's a technology challenge. We need to come up with the technologies. Now, that's the what. The other thing that Bobby talked a lot about, which is where I'll end, is the how. The what is we need technology. The how is collaboration. And it's collaboration focused on scale. So when we're working with smaller companies, we work with lots of universities. And when we're working with universities, we're trying to influence the research for pathways to scale. What metal are you using? What temperatures and pressures are you running at? Those are critical inputs if you're trying to come up with scalable technologies with lower energy intensity. So asking the right questions early on can really shape the research. Very few companies know how to do scale like the companies at this table. The more we can design the experiments, the more we can influence design the problems, the higher the probability we're going to get the right answer. And that's what we've been doing in our three focus areas, which again, Bobby talked about, right? Carbon capture, utilization, and storage. By the way, those are the capabilities we have. It's air movement, gas movement. It's separations, it's conversions. Those are the sciences and technologies we know how to do. Hydrogen, hydrogen's an energy carrier, not an energy source. Energy works by taking an energy source and converting it to an energy carrier. That's actually what you want. You want the energy carrier. So how do you go from source to carrier? That's the challenge with hydrogen. What do you start with? 
to make the hydrogen, and then how do you transport the hydrogen? Biofuels, that's actually a hydrocarbon. Why? Because hydrocarbons are energy dense. And if you're gonna fly an airplane, if you're gonna move a ship, this is physics, this is thermodynamics, you need energy density. Once again, where do you get the energy carrier from? You have to take an energy source and you convert it to an energy carrier. Those are the skills we have that we've developed over 130 years as a corporation. That's our research capabilities. We're a capability-based organization. And the discussion we're looking forward to having is how do you now take those capabilities, continue to do what's needed to be done today, which is continue to provide affordable, reliable, scalable energy, and start moving those capabilities to the technologies that are needed for tomorrow. And that bridge from today, tomorrow, to tomorrow, is my view, is going to be laid in technology. So I look forward to, this, uh, to the discussion, Ken. Thanks. Thanks, Double. Sure. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, and thanks to the Rice Institute for inviting uh, us here to be a part of this panel and spending time with you today. Uh, so my name is Dawal Shah, and uh, I lead the corporate research activities for SOBIC globally. Uh, most of you might have heard about Shell, ExxonMobil, but probably not Sabic. So uh, let me take a minute or so and uh, talk about Sabic. So Sabic is a large petrochemical giant focused on chemicals and materials development headquartered out of Saudi Arabia. It is 70% owned by Aramco, which I'm sure all of you have, uh, have heard of. Uh, and in a, in a unique sort of way, uh, we would have never imagined uh, when the company started about 40 years ago, but the basis of the company was actually sustainability. Um, when you drill for oil, uh, associated gas comes out with it. And in Saudi Arabia, way back in the 60s and 70s, they would just flare all the gas. Uh, the stories I've heard is you would be uh, driving down the east coast of Saudi Arabia, and in night it would be as bright as day just because of all the flaring of the gas, and the oil would be transported globally. So uh, the, the government and the kingdom decided that let's valorize all this gas and make chemicals out of this which are of value to society. And that's how the company uh, started, went through a massive growth spurt over the next 30 years, and now it's uh, in the top three to four uh, petrochemical giants of the world. Um, it did go through a significant globalization uh, step in the 2000s. Uh, it bought the uh, GE Plastics business, uh, DSM's chemicals business, uh, and also Huntsman's chemicals business in UK. And today it is a very global company with locations in 70 countries manufacturing all over the world. Uh, so a very diverse um, group of uh, people and assets compared to the beginnings way back in 70s, right? And so let's talk about decarbonization and the energy transition a bit. And just yesterday we had a review with our, um, with our executives and some of these numbers are fresh in my mind. And I wanted to connect it to something that you can relate to versus the trillions of joules or uh, those kind of numbers that you hear, right? So for Sabic, our 2018 baseline uh, footprint for scope one, scope two was about 57 million tons of carbon dioxide. And uh, we will, for the time being, use electrical energy as an example to uh, what it would take to decarbonize this, uh, this 57 million tons. You would need the electrical energy to about 18 times what the city of Portland uses on a daily basis just to decarbonize the scope one and two. And I haven't even gotten to scope three as yet, as yet right? So uh, that the number is roughly nine gigawatts of energy uh, and Portland uh, uh, uses up about 500 megawatts uh, every year, right? So that's the scale you're talking about, that you're talking about the energy equivalent, uh, which is many, many cities, uh, regions around the world. That's the scale that you need to develop the, uh, the energy infrastructure at. Uh, I've been an R&D guy all my life, uh, but maybe a slight different point of view that I might bring to the table. Uh, I think the problem is intensely in infrastructure and the scale at which things need to be done. I think the technology development will continue. There are lots of good things happening in companies and startups around the world, but it, it is really a scale in terms of the capital deployment and the infrastructure de uh, deployment that is needed points that, uh, that uh, Bobby touched upon as well. I don't think as society we have, in the period of time we have embarked on an activity that will require this, uh, this scale of the capital and the inf infrastructure. Uh, the three main, uh, main vectors of decarbonization that we uh, talk about in our company, and two are primary and the third one is secondary, carbon capture and sequestration. 
and we can talk in the uh, during the questions. It's, we don't believe in utilization as much as carbon capture and sequestration, uh, and then of course uh, elect renewable energy. Hydrogen, as Vijay talked about, is an energy carrier, and it is indirectly dependent upon actually on CCS and um, uh, renewable energy. And to do all of this, we're gonna require a lot of partnerships, right? Most of the large companies traditionally have done organic research. Uh, our DNA to a good extent is all about not invented here to be quite transparent, but what we have come to realize in the last few years is really the scale of partnerships we need to make this happen. Uh, so let me take a pause there, uh, hand it off to, to Aura, and uh, looking forward to the discussion uh, over the next few minutes. Thanks, Dabu. Aura. Good morning, everyone, and it's truly an honor to be here um, with you. Can I ask to share a bit about ourselves and, and how we fit into, into this low-carbon future conversation? Um, and what I wanted to share about me is I'm originally from Colombia. I have been with Shell for almost 25 years now, and I have had the great opportunity to spend uh, my career all over the world, um, half of the in the US, half of it in Europe and Africa. And I mentioned that because I, for me, it has been being able to be truly embedded in different environments that really brings up to light every single day the importance of diversity of thought and diverse solutions that are required for us to achieve a net zero by 2050. A couple more things about me. Um, in 2050, my kids, who are today seven and 11, are just gonna be in their 30s. And I think about that, and I think about, I want my kids to have a future that is at least as good as the lives that we have today. And I want that for my kids, your kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews. Um, there is clearly for me a sense of purpose of, of, and responsibility of being active in this space. And the last bit of me, which I will, uh, as you will see as I transition to Shell, is that I'm certainly a woman of action. And I believe that it is important for us to continue to aspire and have a very strong strategic vision and direction of what we're doing. But it starts with action today, every day. And having a leadership role on walking the talk today um, is essential. So as I think about that and, and to uh, pivot the conversation to Shell, um, I wanted to first kind of frame, as I recognize that people experience Shell in, different, in a different light, depending on your business and background. So Shell's purpose is pretty simple and clear. We want to produce more and cleaner energy for the world. And for us, it's about doing that, following that through uh, kind of four, four key things. One is, first and foremost, we are fully committed to achieving net zero by 2050. And what I believe differentiates our company is that this is net zero in scope one, scope two, and scope three. So if you drove a car this morning, whether you use gasoline or charge, uh, use shell recharge for EV charging, that means the emissions that were submitted, that were emitted uh, through the use of those products, if you happen to use shell gasoline, we are committed to partner and figure out a way to achieve net zero. Keep word in there is partnership, um, especially as you look at scope three. So in terms of achieving our purpose, more and cleaner energy, full commitment to achieving net zero, but really based also on ensuring shareholder value. We are, we are a for-profit company. And the words that resonate the most for me in our journey is we are absolutely aiming and doing a profitable decarbonization. That is key essential. Two key elements there is this is very important to do, be done in the context of respecting nature and powering people. Powering people that to this date um, do not have lights. Um, certainly in Africa, but so is as well in Colombia. So if you say, okay, Aura, that is what you're doing. How are you going to do about it? We continue to evolve as many, um, as I'm sure all of you are, and we'll continue to learn and figure this out. But a couple things that are essential for our strategy is we are very conscious of operating with a, in a way that we name it as customer back. As I'll share more about how we're shaping the business, we are very focused on what does the customer need. So rather than being a, we produce and uh, push our product, we are very mindful of changing our strategy on what customers need. 
So a bit about our portfolio and how that comes across. And I do want to acknowledge the wonderful um, uh, graph that Bobby sh shared around the diversification of the energy systems and the energy sources, if you may. And I'll touch on uh, some of these, and then I'll get to, to the specific action pragmatism of how we're doing about it. So a couple thoughts. So certainly Shell uh, continues to be um, an oil producer, exploration and production. That said, we have a very focused portfolio that peaked production in 2019. And we continue to decline our production by one or two percent a year to 2030. In terms of gas, a big conversation yesterday, we believe that it continues to be a very important source of energy for the world. We increase in demand, especially in Asia, um, but as Bobby shared, it's not the only solution. Gas does play a significant role for Shell in our decarbonization strategy, um, and we will touch more on that uh, in, our, in our conversation today. But let me jump to the new energies and the significant uh, role, Shell that role, that significant role that Shell is playing on them with bringing some examples of those actions. So in no priority, but when we talk about hydrogen, certainly very active in hydrogen for industry in the major hubs here in the United States, especially in the Pennsylvania uh, uh, area, same well as the Gulf Coast uh, bit. Um, but also hydrogen, or also, for example, um, in California, where we have hydrogen for mobility. And today, you can stop by in one of our hydrogen stations and fill in uh, your car with hydrogen if that's what you choose to do. Shell also has world scale today, building the largest electrolyzer in the world, in the Netherlands. You can go to biofuels, and again, taking it home. Currently, as we speak, if you go to Louisiana, our convent refinery is currently in a full transformation to be one of the largest biofuel um, producers for our country and the world. This is done through partnerships. Partnerships with new technology, like la with Lansatech, where we are building one of the largest scales um, plant for producing um, sustainable aviation fuel. I'll jump to power. Power, as you saw in the graph, certainly is going, the electrification of the world is changing and Shell continues to be a lead player in this space. For us, that includes in the power generation with acquisitions of companies like Savion here in the United States, one of the largest developers of, of solar um, power, but it also includes uh, wind wind onshore and wind offshore, um, like strong partnerships we have in Mayflower in the Northeast. Um, that includes in power, trading, but also retail. Today, here in Houston, you can, and I hope you do, come buy um, power for your house from, from Shell Energy. So with that, I would say, if you ask me, so what does it take, and I, I will probably summarize um, items that have come throughout the conversation and my colleagues mentioned, but from Shell, when we look at, when we have something called our Shell scenario, and there are five steps, I'm gonna now hone into the US and say, what does it take to pragmatism and to make it happen? You know, number one, we need to continue to invest in low carbon fuels and technologies, as has been said many times, essential. Number two, we gotta build that infrastructure. A lot said by Bobby and, and colleagues here, essential to actually make it happen. Coalitions, partnership is the third biggest element that we continue to, that we need to continue to partner in ways we haven't partnered before. That um, brings me to policy, essential to continue to progress it in ways that make a low carbon economy real. And last but not least, and perhaps the most important one that has been touched by um, Bobby, and I appreciate Ken's question, as well as Don said yesterday from Microsoft, it is essential that we do this transition in an inclusive and fair way, and making sure that all the vulnerable communities have also access to ample, reliable, and affordable energy. And I think as you look back in what does it take to happen, is the steps on those five areas are essential to happen at the same time in order for us to achieve what we're aiming to do. Thanks, Ara. Um, thanks, everybody. So. Uh, Interesting comments to open. Uh, everybody mentioned infrastructure, everybody mentioned partnerships, and everybody mentioned scale. Um, so I think that's, those are the three threads I'm gonna pull on uh, with, my, with really my first couple of questions I wanna ask you. And again, if anybody has any questions, please um, you know, fill out a card and, and send them up to me. 
Uh, the first one I want to ask, and, and I think I'll, I'll go all the way to the end and start with VJ and just work, 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 work the way back uh, in answering this question. What do you see as the biggest impediment to scale and pace? Um, so in other words, I'd like you to kind of think about not just technology and innovation, but also the roles of markets, the role of policy, the role of social acceptance. Sort of touch on whatever you want to touch on in that umbrella, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Thanks for letting me go first. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting concept there of scale and pace, uh, because those, those the, how they fit together, and again, I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to come back to the three cornerstones. And we, there's a phrase in engineering called equilibrium. And what equilibrium means is, is one, as one is established, the other is then constrained by the establishment of the first. And what you heard uh, through the discussion here was basically the equilibrium between technology, policy, and infrastructure. They, they are inherently linked. So a technology is going to then constrain what policies you have and what infrastructure you have. You want to move hydrogen. That's going, to con that's going to require a certain infrastructure. You want to do renewables, that's going to, con that's going to require a different type of grid, different type of inverters, et cetera. So how, how those all three fit together, to go back to your scale, it was scale and something, scale pace. and pace. E so, th so equilibrium is one thing. Pace is more of a kinetics thing. So what, on the pace side, what you want to do, in my opinion, is you want to take advantage of what you know how to do today. Right? This, this is a continuum. This is not something where we can say we're doing it A today and B tomorrow. It's a transition from A to B, which means in terms of the pace, you need to be doing everything you can do today, running as fast as you can to meet the needs of society while you're beginning to ramp up where you want to go. That, in essence, is a transition. And that's what we're in right now. So, I think which, which, which we've got to think about is how do we keep doing what we're doing today better, more efficiently, lowering the intensity, lowering the emissions, but continuing to provide the energy while we begin to see these other technologies that are going to be required to increase the pace. And, and as my colleagues pointed out, I think we all have examples of things we're doing today. We're investing in hydrogen. As you heard, Bobby, we're, we're pioneering the carbon capture hub. Why? Because those technologies are there today. And so those technologies you can start thinking about doing at scale. So the scales that are being talked about hydrogen, scales that are being talked about around carbon capture and biofuels in our company are scales that haven't been talked about. Why? Because the technology is available and you can start thinking about going to scale. Then you have to be a little humble and say, wow, there's a lot more that still has to be done. So now let's go back and think about the technologies and I'll close it with that comment that we had earlier around the collaboration because that's where the university ecosystem comes in. We didn't talk about national labs a lot about today, but national labs are huge capabilities in the U.S. Uh, that we work with on, a lot, on developing a lot of these energies. Smaller companies that can do the startups uh, and the first deployments, and then ultimately it's getting lots of deployments, right? So the way you get to scale in energy is lots of deployments because with each deployment you get a little bigger, you get a little faster, and you get a little bit more efficient because you learn. So uh, to me, Ken, that's how you kind of stitch it together. And it comes back to those three things and then the pace and the scale to integrate them together. Dov, sure. your thoughts? Yeah, and I'll mainly talk in the context of the, of the chemical sector, right, which is typically called a hard to decarbonize sector. Uh, most of our chemistries occur at very high temperatures. Um, and so you need a certain, uh, certain kind of energy to, to be able to deliver uh, temperatures, you know, that are required in our assets. So let me touch upon, and I'll, I'll use the technology development as a basis for this. Uh, for technology development, there are technologies that exist today, but still require engineering developments. And then there are technologies that don't even exist today, which would be, uh, you know, let's say come to fruition sometime in the 2040s. For the next 20 years of decarbonization, the way we need to think about it is, which are the technologies that exist today but require the engineering and scale, right? And so, for example, we know how to make hydrogen. The world makes about 80 million tons of hydrogen uh, today, but we have, the world has never moved hydrogen at the scale that we are talking about because most of the time it is a captive local consumption. Uh, the same thing goes with, uh, with, with renewable energy like I just uh, spoke about, right? 
when you move renewable energy over the kind of distances you are talking about, uh, may it be offshore wind or remote solar farms, you need to take it to 10,000 volts to be able to transport it without uh, a lot of losses. The kind of electrical infrastructure you need to move it and also to bring it uh, down to where, where it can be used safely in a plant is the second engineering problem that needs to be solved. And all of this needs to be done safely with the appropriate safety constraints both for the employees and the, uh, and the population at large. So that is the typical technology developmental cycle which typically takes you five to 10 years. And we believe that by the end of this decade, the engineering problems will be solved. Associated with that goes now the, the capital deployment and the infrastructure uh, deployment. And I'll give you uh, an excerpt of the discussion we were having with our executives uh, yesterday. Within our plants, we are working on all the uh, things that I spoke about which will be solved sometime this decade. But the big question was, will the infrastructure be ready for us to deploy all of this along with the appropriate capital, right? So that's, that's where the dilemma is uh, that our industry has never dealt with a situation where you are committed to deploying large amounts of capital and building plants without being sure whether the infrastructure is going to come through or not, right? Would the hydrogen infrastructure come through? CCS, will it come through? And it varies region to region, right? We have to think about it uh, in terms of our assets around the world, and we recognize that there'll be different solutions for different assets. So that's where I think the challenge is, that the technology development will occur in this first phase with the ready to deploy technologies, what I call, but the infrastructure is quite a bit unsure and the capital deployment is quite a bit unsure. And then the next generation technologies will come in the 2040s, which will provide the next tranche of decarbonization, right? So that's how we see it uh, in terms of what is possible and not. Interesting. Yeah, that kind of, I think both of you have touched on two common themes that I know I talk a lot about with my colleagues. One is the principle of comparative advantage. So, you know, understanding what you do well and leveraging that for success. Um, Bobby touched on that in his mm -hmm. opening remarks with regard to the Houston area, actually. Um, uh, and the other one is bridging the technology gap. And that gap is something that came up a couple mm -hmm. of times yesterday during the conversation. So um, very interesting. Ara? Yeah. So let me split the answer into first the scale. And I'm actually going to tie in scale and partnerships. Um, so certainly to build the scale requires redeployment of investment on those areas that we're wanting to grow. And why I wanted to bring partnerships and a practical example is, I think about what Shell is um, doing in partnership with Equinor, in partnership with US Steel. I would say with Equinor, we have partnership all over the world for, for many years. Um, the US Steel partnership is different. But it's an incredibly strategic partnership for decarbonizing steel, not just here in the US, but in the world. Think of that example as those, when you have significant players such as those three being able to come together to address uh, this, this opportunity, it allows further empowerment of that scale that, that we need to get, up, get to. That makes me takes me into pace. So pace for me is around how to can, what is required for pace, and I think two things that are essential. One is how can we create more demand for our products, right? How can we make sure that there is um, a market out there that is not just focused on the production of clean energies, but how do we ensure that there is a market, a consumption that is actually pulling on that demand? I love the. Uh, example of Bobby where he says great to build some hydrogen production in an area but if there is not pipeline to get it to your consumers then what's going to happen so when I think of demand the question for me is what do we put in place to also incentivize the market consumption but then I would go back to the, the thought about action and leadership and doing it today and I do believe what is also required to increase the pace is to have more um, organizations, more uh, corporations, such as the Port of Houston, who has gone um, very actively and now has 100% green energy, very publicly provided by Shell, mind you. <laughs> but I think it's those type of examples that help the consumers recognize, hey, this is happening, this is now, it lowers the risk of, of perception and allows us to have more objective conversations of actually making it happen. Thank you. Aaron? Yeah, so when I think about 
what we are trying to do at EDP Renewables in terms of scale. You know, we're trying to go from a company that would build and install five or 600 megawatts a year to a company that's going to build and install two to three gigawatts annually starting next year and, and every year thereafter. For us, there are a couple of pretty significant impediments to achieving that scale. In the very near term, it is the lack of domestic supply for our solar modules. Most of the, of the world's solar panels come from China, which recently you know, has been um, a, a pretty significant impediment to us being able to grow and to, and to be able to install and, and stay on schedule with our projects. So in two different ways. You know, number one, we are caught up in a lot of tariff uh, discussion. So earlier this year, I mean, the whole industry came to a screeching halt because of the Biden administration and the Commerce Department's um, investigation into anti-circumvention. Um, in addition to that, I mean, a very um, concerning issue that, that the industry is facing, especially with regard to modules that are being produced in China or in, in um, neighboring countries around China is the uh, forced labor that is used in some cases um, in China, not just for solar panels, but probably for lots of different um, things that are, that are manufactured in China. And so the world is watching this issue and the United States passed the Uyghur forced labor um, bill last year, which has made it so that every single thing coming to a United States port is thoroughly investigated to make sure that no aspect of the product can get through Customs and Border Patrol until it is proven that no forced labor was used in, in aspects of, of manufacturing. So we have to figure out how to have a domestic supply for solar panels, for batteries, for all of the things that are, for us here in the United States, going to help us to scale. Um, and I think the Inflation Reduction Act will be a major step in hopefully incentivizing that to happen. You know, and, and for me, I mean, I execute on projects, so I day to day, it's really a crisis management type job. And, you know, not just solar panels from China, but getting your massive nacelles and towers across the ocean. And, you know, a few years ago, I had a ship that was riddled with invasive snails and couldn't get through the port. I mean, I, I really look forward to the day when uh, my, you know, towers, nacelles, solar panels are coming from Indiana uh, as opposed to someplace, you know, super far away. The second thing I think is an impediment to scale and this is across the board, you know, uh, is, is labor force. And, you know, I think this is where we all need to partner because we all need more people. And we need more people, you know, doing research and development. We need more people executing. We need more scientists. We need all of those people. And, you know, in the renewable energy industry right now, um, there are not many of us who've been around and doing this for 20 years like I have. And so it's, it's really about teaching and, and training kind of this whole new generation around energy. And I think all of us are going to need to be in the schools and assisting with curriculum development and helping the next generation even understand what energy is and how it works and inspiring them to want to have a career not just in business, but in energy. Um, you know, I don't, I have a niece who just went to college and, you know, talking about a career in energy, that doesn't, doesn't resonate with an 18 year old. We need to figure out how to get energy to be something that, that young people want to do so that they really see the future uh, in, a, in our space. That is going to help us to scale. Um, so, uh, Ara, uh, Aaron, both of y'all actually referred to supply chains in your comments, which is, um, I, I think everybody here has heard that, you know, refrain multiple times over the course of this conference. Um, 
interesting example about the snails. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. it's one know, of my <laughs> talk about a hiccup. Um, uh, so th there have been a, quite a few questions that have been submitted, and I'm going to try to kind of weave, pull a thread through multiple questions at a time to, to get as many of these on the table as possible. Um, so one sort of theme is around energy poverty um, and around leapfrogging. Um, so when we think about energy access in other places around the world and we think about existing technologies that are easily deployable that can provide reliable service versus the newer technologies that are sometimes plagued with intermittency and don't really overcome the challenges in places where there's not already existing infrastructure, existing grids. Um, I wonder if, if you could just sort of talk to that point. What's being done to try to overcome some of those, those issues in order to provide reliable access to clean energy sources as we go forward? And I'm going to go in reverse order this time, so Aaron, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, I mean, for us, we, we are really focused right now on, you know, where can we get a project off the ground as quickly as possible. And so, you know, for us, it is the right, you know, wind or solar resource. It is a community that is excited to have us. It is access to transmission. Uh, and it is, you know, a partner who wants to enter into a per power purchase agreement with us to purchase the energy and the renewable energy credits or a build transfer. So where we, you know, develop, construct, and then sell the asset, you know, to NIPSCO is one of our biggest partners, for example, in Indiana. So, uh, you know, for us, I think we, that often puts us in, in, very rural communities. And so one of the things that I feel very proud to work at EVP Renewables is that from the very beginning, from day one of, of my job here, a tremendous focus is entering the community and how you do that and how you invest in that community, how you you know, invest not just in the annual property taxes that you're going to pay for the life of the project, but also the care you're going to take to the public roads and the care that you're going to take with regard to, you know, whatever is most important to that community, which oftentimes is the soil and water conservation district or, you know, the county fair or the library. But it's, you know, for us, I, I, I do take a lot of pride in making sure that when we enter a rural community, first and foremost, we are building relationships and partnerships with the people because, you know, I, I think it was clear from other remarks, without a partnership at the community level, you're not going to have a project. I mean, there are, um, you know, groups that are forming in every state and they will just travel from county to county to try and rile people up and and have people be against your project. So we have to go in early and, and build partnerships and champions and really build these projects um, together. So I don't think I really answered your question, but that- No, but you did, <laughs> raise, you did raise something. I, I just want to follow it up on, on, yeah. on it real quick. So you mentioned access to transmission, Yeah. right? And in less developed countries, that's a kind of a non-starter. Mm -hmm. Right, but even in some rural, area, rural areas it is. So what sort of activities are you engaged in to expand access to transmission? I'm, I imagine it's a similar kind yeah. of debate that a lot of people are familiar with in the oil and gas. Yeah. I domain, mean, so. for us, the way we are active in that is, is through policy. I mean, we were pretty disappointed that the Inflation Reduction Act did not include the type of incentives that we thought needed to be included to be able to expand transmission in the United States. Um, I think that this is one of the bigger gaps, not, and not just in the United States, across the world, that if we, if we can't figure out how to together invest in, in, in transmission infrastructure, we're not going to be able to carry all this new power to all the, the, the places that it needs to go, and we're not going to be able to provide energy to under, currently underserved communities. So I think that is you know, increasingly kind of for the next 10 years going to be the thing that we, we're all going to have to figure out. So that's, I'm just going to kind of reframe the question I originally asked um, because I think you made a couple of points that 
help that, right? Um, when you talk about leapfrogging, you talk about providing access to energy in either low-income areas or impoverished regions around the world, a major component of achieving that goal is infrastructure. And you have to be able to develop that infrastructure in a way that is commercially viable because you do have shareholders, you do have profit motives. We talk about attracting the next generation of workforce. Well, if you're not a profitable company, that's not going to happen, right? That's kind of first and foremost. So all these things are connected. Um, so in that light, I guess, Ara, can you kind of dive into the original question about energy access and expanding, you know, infrastructure? I will, Ken, and I promise I will talk about infrastructure, but you got me fired up with the first question. Though. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say a couple comments and sure. I'll come back to infrastructure. Uh, because you, you, in my opening remarks, I did share for Shell, and for me personally, you know, enabling a fair and inclusive transition is essential for, for the success. So, I, and I spoke about some people around the world not having um, light, but let me also just be candid we have uh, communities here in Houston today, within minutes drive, that live in neighborhoods that when there is flooding, and it doesn't need to be a major hurricane, they are already in a position where climate change is impacting, impacting them in a disproportional manner. So I don't mean to say that the uh, element around enabling a, a, a just transition is just for very remote places around the world. That happens also in metropolitan major cities like in our country here. So within that, a couple comments, and I will spoke about uh, infrastructure as well, but um, so certainly starts with the, the, the choice that you have on every strategic decision on how you make a difference. And that is when uh, elements like supplier diversity are essential where Shell as a corporation makes it a very explicit um, requirement to ensure that when we are purchasing materials, we are very mindful that that is also coming from enabling business, enabling low uh, women-led businesses, enabling mi minority businesses that in turn are contributing for having those players be part of our economy. This also means, so let's say that's one element, this also means where we choose to, where we look for investments. So we talked about in order to go to scale, in order to make pace, we need to have the right investment. So certainly, for example, we spoke, we have Shell Ventures here, we have Shell Ventures in Boston, but we also have Shell Ventures in India, for example. So for us, it's very important that in order to make a difference to moving uh, in the, um, from the poverty space, that you are in the ground, making sure you're connecting with the specific um, community that we're trying to serve and support. But again, that also comes home here to Houston, and I will share, there is an organization, I share this with Ken actually, uh, Hark, who is uh, a, an advisor and partner with um, a heady committee that Bobby spoke about, but is also partnered with, with Shell. And next week, as a matter of fact, I'm going out with John, who is the, the president of Hark, John Hark, uh, to drive around Houston and actually go and experience Houston through the communities that he is aiming to serve. And I make that point because of the learning space that all continue to be and, and need to be. How does that translate into infrastructure, which is where you wanted to take me? I would say it's about the main, the being very thoughtful about the investments and when you are going to have a CO2 pipeline, being able to engage the community in the ground by having them at the table making sure that they understand the, the benefits um, and understand the, the implications and make sure that they are also better off by having a pipeline through their, through their neighborhood. Or when you're thinking about uh, EV charging and for example, Evolve organization, one of our uh, uh, organizations which many of our corporations are members here in Houston, is making sure that when we are building the EV charging infrastructure in Houston, is specifically also addressing those low income communities. Excellent. So uh, we are getting close to running out of time, but I'm going to ask a different question to, to Davil and VJ because this is a personal bias of mine. I love this question, by the way, um, because it references uh, the first Lego League, which is a robotics contest for 9 to 13-year-olds. So whoever sent this question up, big applause. Yes, fantastic. Um, I actually said at a, at a Senate testimony once because we were talking about um, technology that 
the next great innovation is in the mind of a four-year-old somewhere yeah. playing with Legos. We have no idea what it is, right? And that's why this question resonated with me, by the way. So, um, But it's a great question because it really does, it, it, broadly it asks about what are the best opportunities in existing or incumbent industries uh, for promoting a transition to a lower carbon future. Um, and sort of how are your companies engaging at the primary and secondary education levels um, to help promote that? So uh, Davil, I'll start with you and then, and then Vijay. Yeah, and, uh, and I'll take it one step further, right? In addition to decarbonization, what our industry uh, deals with is also this view that plastics is the enemy and uh, we need to get rid of plastics as soon as possible. Uh, my daughter came from school one day and she said, Daddy, you work in a plastics company that can't be good. And, and I said, okay, that's fine. Just go an entire day without touching any plastic product or using any plastic product and I'll, I'll take your word for it, right? So I think it is really about education, education at the, all the way from the primary, middle, and high school uh, level. And so since our company is highly uh, concentrated in Saudi Arabia, we have multiple programs where we go to universities and schools, and we even have programs where right after high school, we go in and we, uh, we pick a certain cadre of, uh, of students, and we support them for their entire undergraduate education with a committed job at Sabic at the end of that, with a view to promote that you know working in the plastics and the chemicals industry is not a bad idea, and it, it will still be required for many, many dec decades to come. Uh, in regions like the U.S., we do have programs where we spend time with, uh, mainly from a diversity component, so we have programs with Prairie View, and, uh, and I, uh, the second one I think is uh, uh, Texas Southern, if memory serves me right, uh, where we work with them on a, in terms of spending time with your uh, juniors and seniors, uh, these are college level, but also providing them internships to come work in our uh, company for a few months or even a year, depending upon their uh, personal situation, so that you really understand what our world is like and what it means to work in the chemicals and materials industry and, um, and what are the challenges we have to solve, right? So those are the activities that are ongoing within, uh, within our particular company to solve Excellent. that. Vijay? Yeah, thanks for your question. I'm going to try to bring both together. Let's see if I can do it all of you, Bob, okay? Because the first question was leapfrogging. And certainly, it oh, seems like many of us on the panel have spent a fair amount of our lives in developing nations. And I had the luxury of, uh, my father came from India in 1959. And so I had the luxury of spending eight, nine months a year in America and then going back to India to visit grandparents in the summer. And you'd go from cable TV and air conditioning to TV, transistor radio, and a couple of hours of water and things like that, and you saw the leapfrog. And the leapfrog, the, the best example is always telecommunications, yeah. right? So you don't have landlines in developing nations anymore. Everything is over the air. But how do you leapfrog? And I'm going to bring it back to both questions. How do you leapfrog? One of the things we didn't talk enough about up here is parallel processing. Parallel processing will beat series every day. And we know that, right? Because when you buy a computer, what's, what's it say? Parallel processing, right? Parallel, there's a physics behind it, but parallel will beat series. Now let's bring it back to the question you just asked, which is, okay, we have to continue to work with universities because we all recruit, and we all want to work with the universities, and we work with lots and lots of universities, near 80 universities, India, developing nations, you know, I, I work, we work with IITs, we work with lots of universities in the US, lots of universities in Europe. Why? Because one, that's an incubation bed. Most discoveries, most fundamental discoveries actually happen at the academic level. It's, that's the Lego. That's how you, how do you take that fundamental discovery to scale? That's our companies uniquely understand scale. There's not many companies that understand scale or a number of industries that understand scale. It's connecting the fundamental to scale that's the challenge. So that's one part of the parallel processing. The other thing is the inspire and motivate. That's the challenge we have. We have to inspire and motivate, and you have to inspire and motivate at the younger age. I already talked earlier about how you don't get a degree in energy. You get a degree in chemistry, you get a degree in chemical engineering. We gotta motivate the younger kids to like math. We gotta get them back to liking math and science. That's step one. It's parallel processing. You've gotta get them to like math and science. It's very hard to go to a two-year-old and say, you need to like energy. They're not gonna know what that means, okay? You go in there and you try to make it real. 
You try to make it real by telling them math problems. You take them out on a golf course and say, that's 100 yards, and you hit five shots, and they range this, you can now do a standard deviation. You, you can teach them. You make it real. You get them to understand math science. <laughs> Next phase, now you're beginning to get them more into chemistry. Ultimately, you want them to understand energy as the consolidation, but I think we got a parallel process. We got to inspire and motivate the young. These panels are fantastic because it allows us to do it. Uh, and we have to recognize that leapfrogging is not a novel thing. Leapfrogging has happened all the time. And we have to recognize and anticipate where there's opportunities to leapfrog and then jump on the leapfrog and, and go with there. So I think it all does come together, Ken. I think it comes back to the fundamentals of this, which is you gotta do what you're doing today, you gotta do it super well, you gotta keep doing it faster, and you gotta start building that bridge to the future. And I think all four of us have talked about steps our individual companies are doing that. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, well, we are up against it on time. There were several other questions that are really interesting. One about uh, basically demand management, one that's specific to patent sharing and, and collaboration. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are kind of very targeted questions, okay. so I'm gonna encourage you to come up and actually speak to the panelists during the break uh, if you want to follow up on those questions, because they are good, but we just don't have enough time to get to them all. Uh, everybody join me in thanking the group here. Thanks. So we will take a 15 minute break now and then reconvene. I think it's critical to reframe the way we look at energy sources these days. We can all agree that from a climate change perspective, we no longer want to consume carbon and put it up into the atmosphere the way that was acceptable over the last 100 years. Of course, we have the renewables, wind and solar. Those prices have been coming down rapidly. It's a tremendous achievement, but it's not enough. We have to find and invest in new ways to fuel ourselves. So we're still going to want to fly places, we're still going to want to drive places, and we still have to get our goods from A to B. We have to solve that problem for heavy duty, commercial manufacturing. That's what we haven't done yet. In 2020, the United States used 93 quadrillion BTUs of energy. That is 93 with 15 zeros. If you look at all of the uses and all of the fuels and try to map out how we could replace the dirty fuels, there are pathways. Most of those pathways go through clean electrical generation. Electrifying everything is a terrific idea, but it will not help us when it comes to heavy-duty transportation and industry. Almost all of our transportation fleet is based on fossil fuels. For trucks, buses, ships, jet fuel, that's all derived from oil. Where else do I get my emissions from? They come from industry. Things like where I make chemicals, where I make paints, where I make silicon chips, cement, where I make steel. We don't have technologies right now today available that are at high enough technology readiness level that can electrify everything. So what can pick up the slack? One way we can do it is to use sources of energy like biofuels. Biofuels are renewable liquid or gases fuels made out of a broad range of 
sources. It could be a sugar cane, or it can be biomass from forestry, or agricultural waste, where you can apply the different technologies in order to make fuel that can be utilized across the different sectors. There's no change that is required. It's a drop in fuel. You wouldn't know when you go to a station whether you're filling up with petroleum diesel or renewable diesel. It makes it really easy. When you can change behavior by using sustainable, clean burning fuels that reduce emissions by 70 to 85 percent, it's a huge win because the public doesn't have to make that choice. At the same time, there are some dilemmas with biofuels, such as those that come from utilizing sources that are also used for food, such as sugar cane or corn. And so we are working to develop where the next feedstocks are going to come from. This allows us to also develop things like uh, lipids from algae, as well as cover crops, regenerative crops. So this allows you to get an extra growing season in with non-food grade products that have a high lipid content. So you can convert that into a sustainable aviation fuel and renewable diesel. Right, I think we're going to steer away eventually from uh, the, the, the traditional pools that we've got. And it's going to go into things like oil that is going to be made from municipal solid waste, woody biomass, things like that that are effectively inexhaustible. We can also produce things like renewable natural gas. Renewable natural gas is a low carbon fuel made out of organic sources that can come from landfills, food sources, or cow manure. Basically, any organic compound, anything that's been alive at one time, can ultimately be digested into methane in an anaerobic process. It's what happens in the gut of cows, it's what happens in landfills, what happens at waste treatment plants. What is great about renewable natural gas is that it is a drop in fuel. It is completely exchangeable with natural gas. There's now a lot of effort to try to understand if we can scale that up and if we can produce renewable natural gas, renewable methane, then we can use the infrastructure that we already have to distribute that energy for some of those hard to replace large industrial sources. What is also great is that you are using waste which would have emissions and you are turning it into a product that can reduce CO2 emissions depending on how the gas is produced. But the perennial bride at the church waiting for her fiance to show up is hydrogen. Although there's been promise for hydrogen for 30 or 40 years now, its time may have finally arrived. And hydrogen, when it's burned, has no CO2 emissions. Some companies are thinking about hydrogen fuel cells being a key part of the future for decarbonizing the transportation fleet. Remains to be seen if 18-wheelers will go down the pathway of batteries or something like hydrogen. When you get to aircraft, our candidates there could be liquid hydrogen, but we can also create what we call e-fuels. We could basically take hydrogen, I can take CO2, and we can combine those and stitch those together to make long chain liquid fuels that have the density that we like for aircraft. So the other approach is that hydrogen could be utilized as a storage medium for electricity. So you can make the hydrogen when you have all this excess wind and solar and then store it for those times when the wind isn't blowing and the sun is not out. The hydrogen is thought to be better for longer term storage, let's say a few days to a week, where the batteries are thought to be better for those, you know, kind of hour here, hour there needs. Hydrogen is actually a colorless molecule. However, currently in industry, we use different colors to describe how it is produced. Gray hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels, mainly natural gas. Blue hydrogen is also produced from natural gas, but combined with carbon capture, it reduces significantly the emissions. Green hydrogen is produced from renewable energy sources. Over 95% of our hydrogen is produced by the steam reforming of natural gas. That's because it's much cheaper than producing from renewables, although that's changing. 
The Department of Energy has established a hydrogen moonshot goal of getting to a cost of $1 per kilogram of hydrogen in one decade. And so that would be a big win right there. And from that, you could imagine a huge market developing in hydrogen. It takes a while for a new fuel to break in and to have companies comfortable with it to utilize it and at a price that makes it economic. This doesn't happen overnight. To transform that paradigm isn't like switching from incandescent bulbs to LED bulbs. It isn't that simple. It's going to be a lot more expensive in order for us to be able to make that transformation. There is a cost premium. You need to spend your way through it so that you can develop efficiencies, get to scale, and make it part of the mainstream. But th there's a long cycle to that. In the same way that when computers came out in the early 80s, you know, a personal computer would be eight or $10,000 and it was absurd, except look at it now. And because of the early adopters were able to embrace and engage that, the companies evolved and became much more economical. In order to zero out our carbon emissions, we need a lot of solutions and they have to be developed urgently. That means working at the university level on fundamental research, working in industry to get solutions to scale, but working in the middle in the translational work of turning science to solutions to scale. That really requires a, a pull, either from the markets or by policy. So we need to find a way, and he's a big proponent of getting to net zero as an unequivocal uh, uh, requirement of society and as quickly as possible. So the date that is put out there is 2050 and we just can't afford to wait. The technologies are out there, they're constantly searching for more investment and they too take time. So we, that's one of the reasons why we need to start today. We can't wait another 20 years. And that sort of means that we're going to need to be in this place of uh, building the plane while we're flying it for a little bit. With the combination of deployment of so many new technologies, continue working in partnerships across all different sectors between the industry, the government, academia, without a doubt, we can get there.
wondering like what had ended up happening. I got all those emails and then I never heard like an actual date date and I was like, Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Julie Mayo, and I'm a partner in the Global Projects Group at Baker Botts here in Houston. And I'm very, oh, you can't hear me. Well, that's it. All right. Is this better? There we go. Um, OK, so you missed the least important part of this entire panel. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'm Julie Mayo. I'm a partner in the Global Projects Group at Baker Botts here in Houston. And I'm very excited to be here today with this group of panelists to speak about the realities of energy security. And I'm not sure that this panel topic would have been one that we proposed if we were putting this conference together on February 23rd. Um, but the last seven months have certainly brought energy security issues into very sharp focus. And you know, in general, as I, I suspect most folks in this room feel, the past few years have really given the energy industry lots to talk about. So from the death of oil and gas in the midst of COVID to a flood of new technologies and uh, excitement surrounding things like hydrogen, ammonia, CCUS, and others, there's really been something for everyone. Part of what we're here to explore today is really the boom and bust cycle of the energy industry. So what was passe and unfashionable and maybe even three letters of a dirty word like LNG just a few months ago is now a critical part of the energy transition conversation. For many of you, oil and gas never went anywhere. Like Mark Twain, rumors of its death were greatly exaggerated. But it has experienced a so-called resurgence and in any event has managed to claim its rightful place as an integral part of the energy mix and the energy transition. And we're fortunate to have panelists with us here today with diverse perspectives on what the energy security issues look like and what the role of various resources and technologies might be now and in the future. So by way of introduction, with us today we have the Honorable Dan Briette, 
who is president of Sempra Infrastructure and the former U.S. Secretary of Energy. We have Anna Mikulska, who is a non-resident fellow in energy studies for the Center for Energy Studies right here at Rice University's Baker Institute. We have Mark Merrill, who currently serves as president and CEO of Uniper North America. And joining us virtually, we have Colin Parfit, who is vice president of Midstream at Chevron. So I'd like to begin by giving each of our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their roles in the industry and their thoughts on the importance of energy security and maybe even a little bit about the role of oil and gas in that regard. So, Dan, if we could start with you, please. Well, thank you, Julie. Oh, is this one? I don't know if it's You on. have to get Can very close. No, there it is. There it is. Well, thank you, Julie. I appreciate uh, that introduction and the opportunity to be here with today. Thank you, Ken. Thank you uh, to everyone at the Baker Institute for the invitation. Uh, you have a proud and distinguished history, and I'm honored to be a part of your conversation today. The, um, the state of the market is pretty interesting, uh, to say the least. Uh, during my time as Secretary of Energy, I spent a lot of time in Europe talking about the things that we're watching on TV this morning. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in the uh, next couple minutes. But I want to give you just a quick uh, introduction to what I'm doing now uh, outside of government life. As Julie mentioned, I'm the president of Semper Infrastructure, which is a company that is a subsidiary of Semper Energy in San Diego. Semper Energy is a holding company that owns two of the larger utilities in the country today, San Diego Gas and Electric, uh, as well as Southern California Gas, SoCal Gas. It also owns Encore uh, here in Texas. So it's an 80% owner of Encore here in Texas. The fourth leg of that stool is the company that I help run here from Houston. And it's the old Sempra LNG business combined with uh, assets that we owned in Mexico. We've combined all of these assets together, energy trading, renewable generation in Mexico, uh, LNG export facilities in Cameron, Louisiana, where I'm originally from, uh, as well as right here in Texas, Port Arthur is a project that we're developing, and we have some West Coast facilities as well. Um, to say it's a good time to be in the LNG business would be an understatement. Um, what's happening in Europe today, I think, uh, is driving uh, us to understand uh, perhaps more acutely than we have in the past the need for balance in our energy policy between energy security and the climate uh, goals and the environmental security that we also all want. Uh, I am pleased by that rebalancing. I think it's long overdue, candidly. And I think that uh, as we stand here in our business, in the LNG business, we have an important role to play in that rebalancing. When I look at the demand curves, when I look at the demand and I look at the population growth and the economic growth around the world, LNG is going to be a component of our energy portfolio, at least for the remainder of my lifetime. And I would dare say for the lifetime of most of the people in this room. I've not yet seen a credible economic study that suggests that the demand for LNG is going to fall off uh, within the next two decades at a minimum, and it's probably longer than that. So we're excited to be in this business. We're excited to be a part of uh, this equation of balancing energy security and climate security or environmental security, however you want to define it. And I look forward to the conversation that we're going to have today. Excellent. Thanks, Tim. Anna? Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm truly honored to be part of this panel. And um, I'm a fellow here at the Baker Institute, and my my focus is actually geopolitics of energy, uh, particularly geopolitics of gas, natural gas in Russia and Eurasia and the region. <laughs> so I've been very bored last six months. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, incident, incidentally only here. Uh, so I've been looking at this issue of energy security for a very long time, actually, much longer than since the 24th or the 23rd of, uh, of February. Also because I'm Polish and uh, what I kind of get, I want to get into is the differences that actually exist in the way Europe has seen energy security and has seen uh, geopolitics as, as part of the energy security equation. And there has been a very distinct difference between the West and the East of Europe and how 
energy security was approached. In a way, the, both of the regions are quite developed. So the availability, accessibility, and affordability of energy, that kind of the free, free A's, were, were, were there. And in many ways, uh, that was kind of given. People haven't thought about it much. We generally know, just like here in the US that the energy is there whenever we want to plug our iPhone uh, and 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 it's most likely not gonna go away uh, we, will, we will be able to charge it uh, but there is was one more part where there has been a big difference in the way that people have seen energy that comes to Europe and that's the, the fourth a in the energy security equation the acceptability and in the West, often the acceptability meant, well, we really need to make sure that we're going to go re get rid of fossil fuels, replace it with renewable energy, make sure that we run on clean energy. And Germany has been probably one of the big, biggest proponents. In Germany, actually, you, you end up actually also with the issues of acceptability of nuclear power that added to the, to the issues that actually the country is experiencing today. But in in, um, in the east of Europe, the acceptability issues, the biggest ones, were actually where that energy is coming from. And the biggest, of course, issue was that much of the energy that would come to the region was coming from Russia. And that's what those countries didn't like. They didn't like that they haven't been diversified in terms of the resources that they are getting. And and depend on energy f uh, for, 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 for energy on Russia that they did not trust. The trust has been a very different issue for the West, in particular in natural gas, because West has been working with natural gas and Russia for decades, since 1970s, and haven't seen the, the, the disturbances that we've seen now. Um, so Russia was acceptable source for the West and not so much for the East. Um, currently, this has changed. The idea of acceptability has changed dramatically. Um, I want to say the West, most uh, uh, in the West, most more so. Um, in in the East part of Europe, it's been kind of reassured. Uh, but of course, Russian energy has become less less acceptable. Sometimes it's needed, but not necessarily wanted. Um, and also the fact that we need to or use all of the above to ensure that all the, the three other A's are there, the availability, accessibility, and affordability. So we on, not only need to diversify away from Russia or diversify, uh, diversify into many different resources, but also into many different fuels, and potentially that's what is going to be um, something to, that will level, uh, that will allow the developed world, maybe level with the developing world that has known this all along. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Mark? Well, that was easy. I agree with everything they both just said. <coughs> um, my name is Mark Merrill. I'm the CEO of Uniper North America. Uniper. Um, May not be familiar name to, to many of you. I know it is uh, Anna. Um, we are a uh, we are Gazprom's largest customer. We pull more gas out of Russia, or did pull more gas out of Russia than any other company. We were there in 1970. Rugas signed those contracts. So we are uh, our visibility has increased greatly in the last six months. Uh, we are right in the middle of it. Um, um, so hopefully. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak uh, today because I think it's it's uh, absolutely a relevant topic for our organization. Uh, Uniper, just a little more background. We're one of the largest uh, uh, power producers in Europe. We have 34 gigawatts of diversified generation, mostly in northwestern Europe, uh, but also in Russia. We have the largest gas portfolio, one of the largest gas portfolios uh, in Europe, a global LNG business. We, we pull LNG out of Freeport, or, or hope to do so again soon, hopefully in November. Um, but we're also uh, uh, also attempting to diversify. Uniper has an interesting history. It was actually created by the energy <coughs> transition when E.ON spun us off. E.ON is one of the largest uh, utilities in, in Europe. Spun us off in 2016, and, and a, lot of us, a lot of people named us the bad bank because we represented the old traditional energy world with our conventional generation, with our fossil fuel footprint. Um, but you know, key and core to our business was security of supply. That's essentially what we represented. That's what we represent today. So that is, that is clearly uh, in our core. But we also knew, you know, we knew there was going to be a bridge. The transition is a, is a bridge, but we wanted to be on the other side of that bridge as well, not just be the bridge. 
uh, to the new energy world. So we qu very quickly started to diversify, started our own renewable development capability, but also particularly got into uh, a number of areas with green gases, particularly uh, hydrogen, uh, ammonia. So we're working on a number of those, those projects. So I really do think um, security of supply is obviously the, the primary concern right now, and we'll talk about that further, and it, it should be. Um, but I don't think we can go away from the green transition. The green transition is going to happen, and I think they need to happen not just in parallel, but they, they complement each other. I think you need both. Um, it's essential, and I think we can do both. Uh, we have to. And uh, I know Uniper is, is right there and, uh, and wants to participate, is participating and wants to participate in the future in that transition. Um, and I think we have a role to play. So thank you very much, uh, Baker, uh, the Baker Institute and Baker Bots for giving us the opportunity. I, I very much look forward to the, the conversation we're about to have. Thanks, Mark. And now we'll turn it to Colin. Um, are you able to hear us, Colin? I, I can hear you fine. Can you Perfect. hear me, Julie? Yes, sir, we can. OK, good. Hey, well, look, I mean, look, <laughs> hey, thank you a lot. I mean, also thank you, you know, to Baker Institute and Rice University for both hosting the event, but secondly, allowing me to join in virtually. Um, look, I am not far away from anybody else. I'm here in Houston. Unfortunately, I picked up a, a virus, which many of you may have had, and so it's um, best that I'm not with you in person. But look, I'm really, really <laughs> pleased to join you. Um, and look, let me introduce myself. I'm Colin Parker from Chevron. I head up our midstream business in Chevron. So first, that's pipeline power, our trading organization and shipping. But I'm also on the executive uh, committees at Chevron. So I kind of think more broadly in the energy space. And look, if I, I build on you know some of the things that you know Anna and Mark have just said, one of the things that we think about is we think about affordable, reliable, ever cleaner energy and trying to get those three things working together. And if I go back over the last few years, there's lots of talk about ever cleaner and as we move to the energy transition, those first two bits about affordability and reliability have sometimes been assumed. And if I think about reliability like energy security in Europe, that's actually now a huge issue. So, if, you know, if I think really simplistically is I think what does the consumer want to do? They want to be able to turn a go on to file up whatever energy system they get and get heat. And, you know, there were times looking at a Houston audience during hurricanes, winter storms, that can be challenged here. It's going to be significantly challenged in Europe over the next winter or maybe the next few winters. So there is a, a real issue about reliability and energy security. And then all of that, if I think about affordability, is against this backdrop where we've got high commodity prices, oil, gas, coal. I mean, essentially, we've got high commodity prices for everything. So if I think about affordability, reliability, ever cleaner, all of those things have got issues at the moment. But essentially, all of those three things need to be worked together. So um, look, with that, I'll, I mean, you know, I'm really happy to be on this panel, very happy to join in uh, the rest of the conversation. So Julie, I'll, I'll hand it back across to you. Well, while we have you, Colin, why don't we start with you for the next question? So okay. I'm going to get right into the nitty gritty and ask one of the more important questions I think that you've all alluded to and that we're all dealing with. We've talked about the four A's, right? We've talked about balance. We've talked about the challenges associated with that. If you look back at your priorities, even just seven months ago, how have they changed? And how do you rebalance? You know, let's talk about pragmatically and specifically, how are we thinking about balancing all four of these incredibly important objectives to make sure that we get where we want to go, wherever that may be? And so, Colin, if we could start with you, please. Yeah, no, Julie, thank you. Look, I'll try and be fairly short, but look, we're, we're in a long-term business, and so there's a little bit that you try not to, you know, turn too quickly depending on current market dynamics, but you know, there, there clearly have been, a, that's been some change. So if I think about what we're doing, so I have to think about Chevron as a company, two bits of our business, we've got a big oil and gas business. We're trying to grow that oil and gas business, but critically, as we try and grow it, we're reducing the carbon intensity of it. So essentially, our view is the world needs more energy. Clearly, it needs more gas at the moment. And so that's, there's plenty of gas in the United States, and it needs enabling through infrastructure, through LNG plants, and 
ships through regasification to get to Europe. So you see more there, but essentially that's all about how do you increase the supply of energy the world needs, but at the same time do things to reduce carbon emissions. So I'd call it, that's kind of how we think about the traditional business. There is a newer business, new energies, and um, look for us internally, we're focused on renewable fuels, hydrogen, carbon capture offsets. What we're not really focused on as a company is electrification. Other people are. We're focused on what we call some of the harder to abate sectors, some of you know, the big industrial sectors, some of the heavy transportation sectors where electrification probably is not the answer and you've got to think about something else. And then there's a whole bunch of technologies that you have to do. So if you think about then current your markets, you've got energy crisis in Europe, you've got high prices, there's a uh, key, uh, reliability is key. So running your existing equipment as well as you can so that you produce energy today is key. You, you also have to think about tomorrow and tomorrow is enabling some of that gas supply, particularly in the United States, so it can flow to Europe. That's part of the solution. And the other part of the solution is thinking about increasing in the new energy space. So broadly, that's kind of how we think about it. And I would argue that, you know, there's not an enormous change in the last seven months. It might be a slight change of emphasis. Thank you. Anybody else thinking about balancing all of those different competing priorities? Yeah. I mean, from our side, we've been, the seven months, I, I think we're calling, we, it's been a crisis. I mean, clearly, uh, it was a crisis a little bit before February 24th as well. If you remember the volatility that was happening in the energy market, it didn't start on February 24th, uh, but certainly took a, a, a went to a different level at that point in time. So what we've been really focused on is, is uh, security supply. Um, we are critical, and I think that is seen by the, the support that the German government is going to provide, an organization critical to the supply of energy into, into Germany and into Europe. So we've worked on a number of different things. That includes diversification. You know, we take pipeline gas already from other places than Russia, from Norway, from ne the Netherlands, Azerbaijan. We're looking for other opportunities to bring pipeline gas into to Europe. LNG, we've got a global LNG portfolio where we take uh, LNG from the United States, from Qatar, from Australia. We're looking at other opportunities, particularly here in North America, uh, to take more gas over, over to Europe. Don't forget coal. I mean, the coal market was broken before the gas market was broken, um, and we uh, needed to turn back on some of our uh, mothballed coal plants. We need to make sure that we had coal to run. Um, that didn't help if you saw the drought that was going on for the last few months in Europe over the summer. When I went back to, to Dusseldorf and the Rhine was completely dry and, and the grass was all brown, that was a big problem, uh, both for, for some of the nuclear plants, the cooling uh, of those plants, but also for, for getting the commodity that we needed to our power plants, but we, we've done that. So we've really focused, and then not to mention um, filling our storage back up. I mean, that was a, a key uh, issue that is, continues to be a key issue uh, in Europe. The German government came out with a very ambitious uh, requirement to get those storage filling levels up to 95%. We're, we're going to meet that, um, and that's going to be essential for this winter. Uh, let's see about next winter, because I think, I think we're all realizing that next winter is going to be just as critical as, as this winter. Um, so that's what we've really been, been focusing on for the short-term perspective. But we haven't also at the same time forgot about the long-term perspective um, and been having some conversations both on long-term supply of LNG uh, from various, various countries, uh, but also uh, hydrogen and uh, ammonia offtake. So we signed a, an MOU with a, with a project up in uh, Canada. We were up in Canada with um, Chancellor Schultz and, and Prime Minister Trudeau and uh, with Germany signed a... Um, uh, a hydrogen MOU with, with the, the Canadian government and working on that. We signed a, an MOU with, with JARA for a potential um, ammonia offtake and, and LNG from the United States and you know, we signed a long-term uh, contract with Woodside for, for further LNG volume. So we're, we're also we're, we're crystallized, we're, we're, we're very focused on the near term, getting through these next couple of winters, uh, but also understanding laying the foundation for the future, and, and just to mention also infrastructure, that was another thing. Uh, I think infrastructure is, is very important. Um, we've had a, a site, Wilhelmshaven, uh, also almost since the 1970s that we've on and off considered to, to import uh, LNG, and, and finally it's getting going. So we've procured a couple FSRUs for the German government together with our peers. I think we have a total of five now coming in um, into Germany uh, pretty soon, but then we'll also turn uh, Wilhelmshaven into a, finally into a, a regas facility. Uh, for LNG, but with the ability also to convert that uh, to ammonia for, for the long term because, um, like we said, we, we need to, to transition and it was very important for the German 
government, I believe, to have that, that capability um, so that they had a, a line of sight for, for something beyond, uh, beyond fossil fuels. So it's been, it's been a very difficult seven months, I will tell you that. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's over. It's not over. Um, I think the pain is, is going to, to come, particularly the end consumers in, in Europe. Um, but I think we need to stay focused and united, uh, all of us, uh, in solving this uh, problem. You raise an important point there, Mark, which I think would be maybe another A word, which is adaptability yeah. and the importance of uh, being able to have flexible assets and uh, a flexible view toward the future. Dan, did you have some thoughts on well, that? Well, I, I think I agree with where Mark uh, was going and where Colin was going as well. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll speak for Semper Infrastructure. Our basic uh, business proposition, if you will, uh, is that uh, we can meet the goals of uh, the increased demands of energy with natural gas and the environmental goals because to the extent that natural gas replaces coal, we see real, measurable, tangible environmental benefit to that. So that part of our strategy has not changed. We believe strongly in that. We also believe in, in you know, what is commonly referred to as the energy transition, although we may define it a little differently from time to time. When I think about the history, and I've talked to a number of you in the audience about this, you think about the history of energy, um, it's rarely, if ever, been a transition from one fuel to another. That hasn't happened at all, at least maybe with the possible exception of whale oil, but that still, is still used <laughs> as well in parts of the world. But if you think about the history of, of humanity, you know, we started off burning wood. Well, today we burn more biomass wood, if you will, than we did a thousand years ago. We moved to a more um, efficient fuel source, coal. We burn more coal today than we did just 10 years ago or 100 years ago. We burn more natural gas, we burn more oil, we burn more, you know, we use more nuclear energy. And of course, we've added renewable capacities, um, you know, at an, you know, a very high rate as well, which is all good. But if you think about that transition, it's not from one fuel source to another. It's really from less energy to more energy. We're just adding energy to the entire portfolio. So that's why, you know, when I think about Semper Infrastructure and where we are and the needs of Europe and, frankly, the needs of the United States as well, it's important that we support all, all forms of energy and that we bring all of this to the marketplace. Now, that being said, we are also doing things, you know, as Mark alluded to and as Colin has alluded to, uh, like these other com uh, companies, to decarbonize or at least uh, mitigate some of the carbon emissions that we as an industry uh, contribute to the environment. So we filed Class 6 permits, EPA permits, for uh, facility in Louisiana. It's right in the Hackberry area, if you're familiar with that, near the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The geology there is near perfect for the permanent storage of carbon. So our intent is to work with our partners to capture the carbon off of our Cameron LNG facility and then permanently store it right there. It allows us to put a greener molecule into the marketplace. Those types of activities we continue in Semper Infrastructure and will continue. And I would dare say almost regardless of what the incentives may be, I know the Congress just acted to increase uh, the 45Q credits and other things. We're gonna do it regardless because we think it's the right thing to do. Um, as I think back though about this, you know, this move forward, I, I appreciate the, the, uh, the what, it, would it be the fifth A or the fourth A? I the guess the fifth A, a yeah. of adaptability. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that we're doing as well is to prepare um, for what may be the next fuel source, if it's hydrogen or if it's ammonia. And we're using our own infrastructure and, and investing today to ensure that it has that adaptability and that uh, dual use capability, if you will. So those are all important steps that I think we're taking. Uh, but the fundamental point is that we're going to continue to make more energy. We're going to continue to produce more energy. We're going to do what we have to do to develop the infrastructure to ensure that that energy actually reaches the markets. So that's our goal at Semper Infrastructure. If I would say if anything's changed in the last seven months, it's the speed at which we're doing this. Um, Germany has been great. I've talked to Minister Hebeck a few times. I mean, they, in essence, wiped away all of their regulatory structures in order to allow <laughs> Uh, these projects to move at a, at a rapid pace. I applaud that. I think it's important that we do that, just given the acuteness of the situation that we face today as a world. So the speed has changed quite dramatically, but the basic business premise stays the same. Thanks for that, Dan. And I appreciate you making the point about needing every therm. That's kind of how we talk about it at BakerBot. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really important point to make. Um, so, Anna, you alluded in your opening remarks a little bit to the difference between West and East mm -hmm. in Europe. And that's one distinction, right? There's also a distinction between Global West and East. 
um, in terms of you know energy mixes, um, views on energy security, the use of energy as a foreign policy tool. So do you have any thoughts about what might be brewing for the rest of 2022, the winter, um, as we look at kind of differing perspectives both across Europe and across the world? Uh, well, it's not going to be an easy winter, obviously, and uh, as, as Mark ma has mentioned, uh, there might be more of those winters to come, uh, just because of how difficult it's going to be to reorganize the energy system. So when, um, you know, seven months ago, I was looking at Nord Stream 2, <laughs> just like I'm looking now, <laughs> but I was looking at it in a very different, and Nord Stream 1, and a very different um, kind of um, outlook. It's like, well, how do we make sure that those pipelines do not are not going to be a way for Russia to make uh, Europe more dependent or use it, use it as a geopolitical tool. At this moment, we know they have been used in many ways, shapes and forms, uh, uh, and um, um, so we're looking at them, at, them, at them differently. But what also has happened is that seven months ago, we were thinking about how to incorporate Russian energy in Europe in particular, now we're thinking how to replace it completely, and that's a huge change that will not happen from one day to another, and that will uh, actually um, cause a lot of um, pain, uh, both in terms of ab ability to you know, heat your house at an affordable rate, but also um, going forward um, in economic terms. So we already know that a lot of industry in Europe, in Germany especially, has been having issues and ma some of it may never return. This is something that is going to reverberate uh, throughout the European and world economy for many years from now. Uh, so that's something that, that, uh, that we look for. And the ability of um, you know, using energy as a uh, foreign policy tool. It's it's very different in the East in terms of, of course, uh, in terms of uh, Russia uh, and uh, West in terms of U.S. in particular. But it's really quite valuable experience that um, you know, well, qu quite a valuable part that the U.S. can play, provided uh, given that um, the energy that the U.S. provides is not really related directly to the policy, but it's related to the market. So yeah, we know that markets are not predictable necessarily, but that we know also how they work. They work on the basis of supply and demand. Whereas if we depend on governments to set up um, energy flows based on their policy, we really cannot expect, we, or we can expect anything or everything. And that predictability is, is decreasing, particularly if those governments are like that of Russia. Uh, so that's, I think it's, it's quite, quite important to, to underscore mm -hmm. that, yeah, markets are imperfect, they difficult to predict, like previously uh, somebody was saying about, you know, really not trying to predict long term, but at the very least we know the factors that influence markets. We often don't know what influences policymakers um, in many countries that own um, quite a lot of energy resources. I think that's an important point. And, you know, policy um, and governments can be very helpful and they can be very harmful, right? Um, and we've seen examples of both, I think. You know, we've seen examples of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, in the United States, which may spur significant additional investment. Um, we've seen attempts of, you know, some of our, our elected officials to, um, you know, support U.S. industry in an attempt to also help our allies abroad. Um, but there has to be coordination between industry and government. And so maybe I'm looking at you, Dan, um, thinking maybe you might want to lead us <laughs> yeah. off on this one. But, you know, kind of, <laughs> and I'm not putting you on the spot. But, um, yeah. but, you know, the idea would be how can we effectively, you know, kind of manage that interplay between governments and markets? Well, I think there's an obligation on both sides. I mean, I do think there's an obligation on the on the on the side of industry to interact with the government, to be a part of the process, to be a part of the conversation uh, that happens in places like Washington or in Austin or in state capitals around the, the rest of the country. Um, you think about yourself as an educator in that role, not so much as a, a politician. When you go into a, a political office, you're not there really to you know, to talk about a campaign or talk about other things. You're there to educate. If you think about the system we have here in the United States, you can go from being a fireman to being the president of the United States. That's the beauty of our system. Well, 
if that happens, you probably don't know much about the business that all of us are in. So take the time and engage. The obligation is also on the other side. I mean, one of the more uh, important things that I thought that I did as secretary and even as deputy secretary was to reach out to the industry, make sure they were coming in, to make sure they understood what was their business plan, what was their business model, what was important to them. And it, that, that obligation goes both ways. And you know, today I think we maybe have lost a little bit of that uh, in terms of our, our political debates here in the United States. It tends to be more polarized than I personally think it needs to be, especially with regard to these issues. Um, but that obligation goes both ways. But I also think, too, um, you know, back to my history, I, you know, before the DOE and all of that, uh, I spent some time on Capitol Hill. I was the chief of staff, staff director, if you will, to the Energy and Commerce Committee. And uh, we helped write uh, the 05 uh, Energy Policy Act, which governs a lot of the business that I happen to now help run. The, um, the point of that is back then, and perhaps before, you know, we tended to focus on common goals first, and then everything else went to the margins. And um, today, I think we start at the margins and try and find our way back to the middle. And the process seems a little bit backwards. What we did back then was to focus on, to your point, uh, Julie, was, you know, we need every therm. So every conversation that began, whether you were on either side of the aisle, began with how do we produce more energy? Because our population is growing. We want our economies to grow. We want our, um, we want our country to be a good trading partner with all of our allies. We have a foreign policy element to this that is important to us. But we started with that common goal, more energy. We need more energy. How we get there, we can debate around the margins, but more energy. And I think that's a place that we need to get back to uh, here in the United States. And I think as we think about you know, the rest of the world, um, that approach begins to solve. It doesn't solve all, but it begins to solve uh, many of the challenges that we face today. Thank you for that. Um, all of you have really touched on infrastructure and the importance of infrastructure in addressing some of these issues. And um, as we all know, infrastructure um, is very expensive. And um, when we're talking about one of the sub-themes of this panel, which is what's old is new again, you know, we're anticipating a significant amount of continued investment in the United States um, on oil and gas infrastructure. We're also trying to address both short and long-term energy security issues. And so how do you think about the development of such capital intensive projects with long term um, goals and objectives and balancing that with solving for short term problems? You know, will the will the time be right when some of these projects come online? And um, so maybe if you could get out your crystal ball, I don't know if you want to go first, Colin. Well, no, no I, I was just thinking, Julie, so thank you on your thought, is, is the timing right? And I was kind of looking at Mark and thinking about his comments on Germany. Unfortunately, you know, I mean, you're right, developing infrastructure takes some time. And so if I think about, if I just think about the Europe issue at the moment, where Europe is short gas because of the lack of flow from um, Russia coming across, my view is there is plenty of gas in the world and a lot of it here in the United States, but actually some of it's you know, underground to be developed and it can all get to uh, markets like Europe, but you have to you have to create the infrastructure. So you have to create the pipelines. You have to create connect the LNG plants, the ships, the regas terminals, and make all of that work. It's all doable, but those are not let me say three years if you're really quick and you've got a, a standing up five year type thing. So over time you can do it. And I mean, look to you know Dan's point, and look Dan did a really good job when when he was in government of doing just what he described of of listening and connecting with the industry. I mean, we do have an issue in the United States around permitting of this and just the time it takes to permit infrastructure. And I think one of the things I think if I think about partnership between industry and government, it would be to do something about the speed of that. Because that's true on you know, an example I was giving, which was really a gas to LNG markets issue. But that, that issue about how do you create the new infrastructure, that's true with new energies to, to, as well. So whether we were thinking about developing a gas pipeline or a CO2 pipeline or hydrogen, or if you were thinking about long distance electricity, all of that has the same issue is that we actually have to uh, figure out how to permit and get that infrastructure to work so that we get the, the energy the world needs for tomorrow 
in the right place for it. So yeah, it's capital, it's long term, and it's a it's a partnership between industry and government that will make that happen. If I could jump in there, I mean, I think two points. First, on the permitting, um, I, I completely agree, and I and I go back to um, what Dan said about uh, Minister Habeck, and you have to remember that the two. Um, well, the, the Minister of, of Economics and Energy is the head, also the head of the Green Party, but the pragmatism that he, well, the, but the, he laughed, but the pragmatism with which he acted over the last six months is very commendable. I mean, we've been flying around uh, sourcing LNG, you know, turning those coal plants on, uh, back on. This week was a decision to extend the life of the two of the nuclear plants. Probably another one's going to get turned on uh, or kept on. I mean, I think that is the kind of thing that we need uh, going forward. Um, at all levels, and particularly also here in the United States. I mean, it is a, we, we do, I like that, we have to agree on a common goal and then all agree that we have to give and take to, to get there. I think it's very important because that goes into the other question. If you asked me last year, probably not on February 23rd, but a, a year ago, what is the biggest issue that we had in getting the energy transition done? It was financing, right? The banks, it was, we all know we need that bridge, but nobody wanted to touch the bridge. They all wanted to touch the other side of the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and That's hard to do. And, <laughs> and now, I mean, I think you see a little bit of, a, of movement, but there is still a, a hesitancy. We all, I'm sure every one of your companies out here is committed to some kind of carbon neutrality by 2040, 2050. Um, and, and there is this concern about how long, you know, these, these are big projects that we're doing here. We're asking for long-term 20-year commitments to, to, for some of these things. And, and there, we, I think we have to get a consensus around, you know, um, we have to come together and say, look, we, we all understand, we all want to go to the same place, a greener world, um, but we have to commit maybe to the timelines that we weren't ready to commit to uh, six, 12 months ago to, to get there. I think it's very important. I agree with you, Mark. I think, I think it's, um you know, in, in a perfect world, in a vacuum perhaps, we could think about this, again, to use that word transition as, you know, uh, some sort of bridge in the middle. The problem is that we're not living in a vacuum. We're not living in a perfect world. I mean, there are externalities today, you know, the announcements by NATO that potentially the Nord Stream pipeline was sabotaged. That's now going to be off the market for a long time. So what are we going to do to replace that gas in Europe? And um, you know, the debates around whether gas is good or bad or whether, you know, this technology is good or bad or this fuel source is good or bad, I personally think needs to be set aside for a moment in time. And we need to understand that the needs of the population, the needs of the citizens around the world must come first. And I applaud what Germany did, I said earlier. I also applaud what, what other governments are doing around the world. I just returned from Asia last week. And they're doing much the same in places like Japan. They've made fundamental decisions to restart their nuclear power, to bring those reactors back online, because they do not want the lights to go off. And I think that's exactly the right decision. So we have to focus again on the production of energy. Um, how do we get more? How do we, how do we make it resilient? How do we make it safe, secure uh, first? And then we'll work at the margins to figure out uh, what the longer term should look like. If I, if I could yeah. add, actually, um, uh, kind of looking at the bright side to an extent, being the Pollyanna and not only Anna, uh, <laughs> on, the, on this, uh, yeah. uh, there is a lot to be said about the fact that many of the developed countries that thought they are done with coal and fossil fuel and kind of really d divesting from fossil fuels now um, are in the point that they actually have to invest in them. But they are not ready to get away, with, with, you know, go away with the goals of decarbonization. And what means we should see more focus, more investment into the de decarbonization technologies, um, like CCUS, like others, uh, that would never or would take a much longer time to develop in places that are not as well developed, like places in Asia, that will continue, as we know, to use fossil fuels for decades to come. So if that's the case, maybe we are at the point where those technologies will develop because there is gonna be re there are gonna be resources, there's gonna be R&D, there's gonna be the brain power, and they're going to become scalable and then put in other places that otherwise would not be able to have them. And in that way, actually get some more of decarbonization goals that we would have in those regions that are growing in populations, that are growing in energy use um, going forward. 
You went exactly where I was going to go with <laughs> that, Anna. And, and, you know, it almost kind of harkens back to some of what we heard on the prior panel about leapfrogging, right? Um, you know, I mean, some of the same ideas about um, what development looks like and what energy security looks like as some of these lower carbon projects are, um, you know, maybe workshopped in the developed world and then brought to other parts of the world. Um, you know, I think several of you have mentioned the fact that we all have net zero targets or we all have lower carbon com uh, commitments that we've made publicly. This has become a very important part of um, ESG um, policies for companies, you know, new SEC reporting requirements. It's really come to the forefront. And uh, as we sat here last year, um, that was a hot topic. Who's made a commitment and what type of a commitment have they made, both at the government level and at the corporate level? And a lot of what we're seeing now is a little bit of a struggle in balancing those not necessarily competing objectives, but um, making sure that we're making good on our commitments at the same time as we are expanding um, you know, all of the terms that are available. So how, if at all, um, and particularly considering that that's both a short-term piece and a long-term piece, right? We've seen some flexibility on some of those targets in the short term, but there is um, suspicion or hesitancy about whether that same flexibility will extend to longer-term contracts. And we need long-term contracts to support some of the infrastructure investment. And so how do you see some of those issues playing out together to support the investment in infrastructure that we need with that uncertainty? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I think it's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. It's really early in the process, too, I suppose. <laughs> so predictions will be way off the mark, I'm almost certain. Um, I mean, we, we at Semper are seeing, you know, some reversion back to longer-term contracts. I mean, earlier this year, last year, we started to see some shortening of the timetables, uh, particularly from European customers. You know, wanting um, you know very near-term uh, contracts in order to meet a 2030 goal or perhaps some other goal that they had set internally with the company. But we're starting to see a reversion back to the longer-term contracts. 15 and 20 years have been the industry standard, and we're starting to see that come back. And you know, as you mentioned, uh, without that, it's very, very difficult to finance some of these large uh, infrastructure projects, especially here in the United States or really anywhere, but especially here in the United States. Given the other economic factors that we're dealing with, things like inflation rates of you know seven percent plus, um, looking at the tightness in the labor markets, I I grew up down in this area, not far from here in Louisiana. I grew up a pipeline welder. Uh, I kind of wish I was still in the business because those guys are making a lot of money today. Um, the labor market is very tight, and they can name their price. Uh, so, but th that creates another inflationary pressure that we're seeing. But. All of those things are, 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 are externalities that we can deal with as an industry. Um, I go back to what was talked about earlier. One of the things that I think we need to really, really focus on, and it's related to the ESG movement, is the permitting process here in the United States. Um, you know, we need, we need to do something seriously about NEPA and NEPA reform. Um, I see my friend George Fibby in the, in the, in the front row here. Uh, an expert uh, trial attorney, somebody who was in court all the time and would argue every day that you need your day in court. But I would ask George, do you need four or five bites at the apple at the same, at the same question? He would and say it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's important that we look at these processes and, of course, avail, you know, l let people avail themselves to the court system to uh, resolve any grievances they may have. But we can't allow an extended... 20, 30, 40 year process to unfold in the courts. Um, you know, as, as some in the industry have said, I forgot exactly, I don't know where the quote's from, it takes longer to permit some of these projects than it actually takes to build them. That, that's, you know, if, if that's truly where we are, then we have a problem and we need to address it squarely. <clears throat> Maybe one thing we could do, and I think we're doing a very good job of it, I, th I don't remember what panel it was yesterday, but somebody talked about um, the methane emissions from Russian gas. And, and that was actually something the Russians often used, was saying that their, their gas was cleaner than the US gas. Sure. Um, whether that's true or not, um, I, I have my doubts. But um, I think something that we're really working hard on as an industry here in North America is cleaning up that gas system. 
And then once we clean that up, we have to educate our customers across the, across the globe, particularly in Europe, about how we're doing, uh, what we're doing to reduce methane emissions, what, we're, you know, what, are, what is the actual uh, environmental impact of fracking. Um, I heard, and I'm, not sure, I'm pretty sure this is correct, that 89 to 90 percent of all the gas in our, in our pipeline system is, is frac gas, and it surprises some Europeans. But we need to go out there and educate people. Uh, because I think that's very important, and, and you know, I think there it has changed some minds. Now, obviously, the, the, the current events have changed some minds, but particularly when you get over there and you start talking to people about what we're doing, um, they, they, they get more comfortable with it, and I think that will help uh, get them comfortable with signing some of these longer-term contracts that they need. Yeah, we agree as well, Mark. We, we, we are very active in the conversations to determine, um, you know, I guess what's commonly referred to as the life cycle analysis of our projects and the gas and uh, very committed to both you know, methane uh, reductions, but also just quantification of uh, what's actually happening. As you all know, a lot of this is, you know, it's estimates that we're dealing with from time to time. So if we can get to a point where we can actually quantify the carbon intensity of a molecule, we think that provides the right information to the marketplace so that consumers can make the right decisions over time. And perhaps even we can move away from, you know, this col color screen, uh, scheme that we deal with all the time, green, turquoise, pink, purple, whatever. <laughs> Um, you know, what's green here in, in, in the United States may not be green in Europe. What's green in Europe may not be green in Asia. So if we can move away from that to a pure, quantitative, mathematical, uh, precise measurement of carbon intensity, I think that serves the market really well. Hey, Julie, if, if I could just jump in, I'm just going to I'm gonna agree to a couple of points that Dan and, and Mark have made. It's, look, I mean, I build on Dan's point, completely agree. You know, as an industry, we need to get better. There, there are good things going on, but, you know, really making sure we measure and reduce the emissions of our current business is key. But, you know, going back to your earlier question, we're, we're around long term. Look, I agreed with what Dan says. We are seeing more customers now go and look for long term LNG. Interestingly, one of the things that's happening is you, there is some of that coming from Asia. And if I think, you know, going back and again, Dan, you mentioned this earlier, if you think about what both the United States and Europe has done over time to reduce its carbon dioxide emissions, one of the big things it's done is it has substituted coal and substituted that for gas in, in natural power. Asia's kind of got that game ahead of it, and you absolutely see that. So you see demand for gas increasing in Asia. And so one of the things that, you know, to think about, and, you know, to Mark's point is for Europe is making sure that Europe actually has the, you know, the right or kind of thinks about this in a connected fashion, because there's a little bit of competition at the moment coming from Asia in terms of thinking about how do you think about long term LNG? So there's a there's um, and Anna, you talked about east west split. You start to see that a little bit in the markets at the moment where you kind of get a slightly longer term view from our call it customers sitting in Asia than you do in Europe. And I completely understand why that is in Europe, because you've got this real short term crisis that people are trying to get through. But, but that's, yeah, I don't want to, no, before we're out of time, I, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing that's happening in the marketplace today. And I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a PhD economist, so please take these comments uh, with a large grain of salt. But it's interesting, you know, as we think about, you know, what's happening in the marketplace with prices. I remember from my days as a young congressional staffer, folks would come in and make the argument that we need to raise the prices of certain products so that we can discourage its use we would tax certain products in order to take it out of the marketplace. It's interesting today as we look at pricing around the world, high prices in the energy place, in the energy space today, is actually creating a reversion to more carbon intense fuels. So it's working against what some had argued in, in the years past. And that's why I think if, as we think about you know, our energy needs, uh, obviously the, the supply demand equation, you simply produce more, you reduce the price, perhaps you limit some of that shift to more carbon intense fuel. So it's a thought, um, ponder it. You guys are a lot smarter than I am. Anybody got any comments? Shoot them my way. <laughs> well, since you've mentioned comments, I'm gonna need an extra hour of everyone's time because we've gotten some <laughs> phenomenal questions. Um, and I'm not sure where to start. I wanna ask all of these, but we are gonna run out of time. So I'm gonna start with the one that caught my eye the most just because of the way it's phrased. So assuming that the Russia-Ukraine war is, quote unquote, settled. Do you see Europe ever going back to Russia for its energy supply? Yes, if we can't supply <laughs> energy. Um, like, I, I don't know how the, you know, this is going to get settled. Hopefully it's peacefully and soon. 
Um, but I do think, you know, in order to meet the needs of a growing Europe, uh, there will probably be some Russian energy into the European uh, markets. Uh, will it be, uh, again, a 40, 45 percent dependency? I would suggest no. Uh, I, I don't think that that ever happens again. There's been some hard lessons learned here. But, you know, can I see some de minimis amount? I, yeah, I can at the margin. I, I, I might jump in on because I'm very similar. And my view on this is if I think about how much gas was going to uh, Europe from Russia pre Russia Ukraine, and if you know, we magically stop that war today, which would be great. Um, I don't think that the flow will be anything like it used to be because essentially trust is broken. And so I think that lack of trust will be will mean less. I also think that it probably won't be zero because essentially if it's zero, that means that Russian gas has got nowhere to go until you can build pipelines to China or to somewhere else. So I think there will be an economic incentive. So my sense is if it could end, I think there'll be some, but it will be way less than it were before. And exactly where it balances out, it's a bit hard to tell. Yeah, and I think it depends how it will be settled, mm -hmm. um, who's going to be in power in Russia, mm -hmm. and whether that person or the, the, the bloc is going to be acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, there is a moral imperative there that we've seen uh, overcome any type of profit imperatives, including companies that backed out from Russia before even their governments acted, so that's important. Um, I think if any, at any point uh, Europe comes back to bring in Russian supply of gas um, or any other type of energy, that supply will be heavily backed up. Uh, yeah. Very different than it was uh, bef um, you know, before, before the war when uh, you would have you know, two, uh, actually four pipelines of Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 that could bring 110 BCM of uh, gas to Germany directly from Russia which would be more than half of what Russia supplied uh, yearly uh, to Europe without any type of backup uh, in terms of LNG terminals and so on. And the idea was, yeah, there was a lot of trust that was developed where the German government and German companies trusted Russia to bring that gas, uh, well, until it didn't. And, but there was no backup, so there was nothing to replace it, and that's why we, sh we saw the scrambling to get the LNG terminals going. And Germany was kind of lucky in the sense because a lot of infrastructure was there, because there have been a lot of talk about how can we get alternative supply, and there were plans in Wilhelmshaven, uh, Brownsbüter, Stade, all these places they already had some of LNG infrastructure developed. I think um, Stade or, or Brandsbrittel actually had some LNG transfers already in terms of the uh, bunkering. So that was, that was helpful. But, um, and I think it won't, any type of energy that comes from Russia won't be left without a backup uh, right now. Absolutely. Um, so we have multiple questions about nationalization. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to get there. So, we, uh, so some question about the nationalization of the German and French utilities. And, you know, what impact do we think that that might have on short term versus long term, you know, well, I guess short term and long term impacts. And then also what impact does it have when you are negotiating long term contracts to potentially support some of these critical infrastructure projects? Well, I would say from our perspective, the, the, the deal that was announced um, foresees the German government taking 99% of our, of our company, ownership in our company, um, but, and it, it's not complete yet. There's some regulatory approvals that are still outstanding. I mean, it was just announced uh, last week, and, and as we can see, um, things are, are, are fluid, but we fully expect that to happen in the next, uh, hopefully by Q4, the end of Q4. Now, from what I understand, is that our mandate should not change. So everything I talked about here today about um, continuing to, to play our role in the German energy system, continue. That, that's why they're investing in this, is because we supply hundreds of utilities in Germany. We supply most of, of the large industrial customers in, in, in Germany um, with gas. Um, we have the, the largest, um, we're the largest um, operator of storage, gas storage facilities in, in Germany. We have them tough, and we're flying around the world trying to source source LNG f for for Europe. So I think our mandate will will stay. So I, as far as the fi the financing and them standing behind us, I I, I hope it be makes things easier. Um, <laughs> but I have no I have no information whether what the details are of that. 
as far as I, I do think my personal opinion, as you saw with, with the EDF example, um, I, I do think you'll see much more, well, you've already seen a substantial amount of government intervention across mm -hmm. Europe with the price caps, um, with the liquidity, uh, you know, my background is, is trading, so watching what's happening on the energy markets across the world, but particularly in Europe on, on NASDAQ and, and EEX and everything, the liquidity requirements. So you see these funds being provided by the German government, by the Finnish government, by the, the Swedes, by the UK. I think you'll, you'll see continual intervention in, in those types of markets, in the actual, in the, in the, the exchanges. I, I think you'll see continued price caps trying to, to somehow um, shield their citizens from these, these prices that are coming. Um, you'll see that, and, and I think you will see over the next, again, my, my personal opinion, uh, you'll see fundamental market redesign of, of, of the European gas market, so, or European electricity market as well. So I think the, um, we, are, we are going to see an increased level of further government intervention over the next months and years. So I think we've got time for one more question, and I'm not gonna ask this question exactly as it's written. Um, I'll tell you how it's written, but then I'm gonna ask a slightly different question. So, um, and for those of you who submitted questions, and if we don't get to them, I'd certainly encourage you to please come up and um, chat with our panelists, um, except Colin. Um, <laughs> um, so, so the question asked was, will Europe survive the winter, and how? Um, and so I'm not going to ask exactly that question, but what that makes me think about is maybe if each of you could give us one positive takeaway from the focus on energy security that you see that might benefit, um, you know, either from an economic perspective, a policy perspective, um, you know, kind of a, a universal perspective. Um, uh, you know, I'd be interested to kind of end on a positive note here. So maybe, Colin, if we could start with you. Okay, so look, <laughs> um, look if I think about a positive, and I think about the positive of the current crisis, it, it, I think it's helped us get to a conversation that says, um, we need to do all of this. And so that, yes, we need to get think about a cleaner future. We've got to think about energy transitions. But while we're doing that, we actually have to think about energy reliability and affordability and do all of those together. And we have got into, Dan talked earlier on about how people sometimes go to extremes. And so there was a, the, we've had some extreme narratives around how you could do this and you could do it tomorrow and it would all be for free. And, and actually the system is much bigger and more complex than that. So I think that the positive around the kind of energy security crisis is, I think that's helped people to understand that the energy system is really big and uh, you, there are a whole bunch of connected things you need to do together to make it work. So look, I'm an optimist. I actually think that we can do all of this. I think we can create a reliable system. I think we can create a cleaner system and I think it will be affordable. I think we can do all of those three things together. I think this crisis may have helped some people think that you actually have to think, and again, Dan talked about, you have to think about a whole bunch of different forms of energy to make this work, not just one type. So I think that's my positive is it might help people think about this together as a system. I agree with all of that, and I, I am optimistic about Europe's future. I, I, it will be a tough winter, perhaps, uh, maybe a tough next winter, too. But I think about my, my grandfather's service in World War II. Uh, Europe is a resilient place. They're resilient people. They're going to survive. They're going to do well. They will rebuild. They've done it before. They know how to do it. And we'll, this, too, shall pass. We'll get past it. Yeah, I think it's, there is a dose of reality that has been injected uh, by the conflict uh, that um, we see, uh, that we are not immune, all of us, um, that uh, things happen in the most developed and most wealthy parts of the world. And that also relates to energy. And I think that will help us have a dialogue with those who don't have that energy. Because um, some of us, as people in Europe, are, do have that experience of potential scarcity and we'll look at things differently. So in a way, I think there might be bigger progress and kind of looking forward to different COPs and how the developed and developing countries work together and talk together. Maybe there is going to be a way in which um, they can level differently and think of different solutions um, rather than kind of signaling virtue on one side and saying we cannot do anything um, because we need to develop on the other. Yeah, I, I, 
Europe will survive this winter. I mean, I think. <laughs> well, I mean, because of the, the the hard work that's that's been done over the last six months by a number of by by everybody, um, it'll be difficult this winter and next. But I, you know, they they will get through it. Um, along those same lines, I mean, I I started my career in 2010 in, in Europe. I've, I've been most spent most of my career in Europe, and it's been really interesting to see over the last six months the fundamental rethink that's gone on by a lot of people. Um, a generation of, uh, above me. You know, really was focused on on that Ostpolitik, that that uh, relationship with Russia that's fundamental to the way they thought, and, and there's a number of different reasons behind it. But the the rethink that's gone on in that has been very very interesting to watch. But also on the from like I, I mentioned earlier, also from from some of the people that that's main issue was was the green transition and everything. They've also had a fundamental rethink, and I and I think what's going to come out of this is actually an accelerated transition. And I think that's going to be good, good for everybody, a, pr a more pragmatic, accelerated energy transition that is going to include much more uh, sources of energy than, than what we thought about uh, doing or many thought about using uh, previously. So I, I've never been very, very uh, infrequently described as an optimist, but in that respect, I, I am. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you all very much for your time and for your insights today. This is fascinating. And as you can tell by the number of questions, I think our audience thought so as well. We're going to take a brief 10-minute break before we welcome Secretary Baker to the stage. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you.
excuse me. Excuse me, everybody. Could I have your attention, please? <clears throat> excuse me, I need to ask, excuse me, can I ask everybody to take a seat because Secretary Baker is about to come out. Um, we'd like to go ahead and get this, get this started, part of the program. Thank you. Take the first one. I'm not kidding. Let me uh, thank you all uh, for what has been, I think, an extraordinary two day summit. Nice. The panelists, the speakers, the discussion have been focused. They have been, I think, illuminating. And they have been absolutely critical to an understanding not just of the present situation faced with respect to energy, risk, likely futures, but also options for dealing with what is a deeply, deeply concerning international situation, domestic situation for us, for key allies, not just in Europe, but around the world, 
uh, to how we go forward. Um, we are not at the institution or in the Center for Energy Studies or Baker Botts committed to admiring the problem, We're committed to looking at ways forward that make sense and that will achieve goals. But um, with our honored guest here, Secretary Baker, I want to turn the discussion to a specific topic which has been referenced throughout the last two days. And I'll, I'll start by noting a perhaps apocryphal but outstanding remark attributed to Prime Minister Harold McMillan. When asked by a journalist, it said, what throws off government plans, most critically? And he responded, events, dear boy, <laughs> events. Well, we're dealing with events right now that have a critical impact. And those events have come fast and furious over the past week to 10 days. The war in Ukraine continues, not just continues, but the doubling or tripling down by Putin in terms of references to the possibility of nuclear weapon use, the faux referenda conducted in the Crimea, in the southern provinces, in the east, the possibility of annexation of those territories to Russia, all of this and the explosions on the Nord Stream pipelines have added to the sense of perhaps desperation in Russia, but certainly concern on the part of the international market as to where this all is going. And so, Mr. Secretary, I place you in the, the crosshairs here. Where do you think this is all going? David, <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think anybody really knows. I can give you, and I will, uh, a couple of thoughts that I have. But first, I want to welcome you here. Uh, we've got our, our second director since the, in the history of the Baker Institute. And we worked hard to recruit David. You're going to see, if you haven't already noted, he's going to be a formidable director of this institute. We're really delighted to have him here. He's an outstanding diplomat and public servant. He's got a wonderful record. Uh, but more than that, he's a damn good fly fisherman. And he's, he's gone up to my ranch a couple of times. Actually, the first time he went there was when I went up there as Secretary of State, and he was on my detail at the time. He's, he wipes the, the stream out. I don't ever want to follow him on my stream. Uh, I'm not being facetious when I say I don't, who knows how this is going to turn out. It's quite obvious, as you indicated in the question, David, that Putin has bitten, bitten off a lot more than he can chew, and surprisingly so. I mean, I, I remember when he first went in, uh, I wasn't at all sure that he would go in when, I, when all those troops were massing and everything. Uh, and and then the then the storyline became how long is it going to take three or four days, a couple of weeks? You'll control the country. You'll put his puppet government in there. That's the playbook uh, that uh, Russia has been using. It's the playbook they used in Crimea. But I'm you know but we've all been pleasantly surprised uh, at the at the courage and the, and the, stick to itiveness, if you want to call it that, the courage and the uh, ability of the Ukrainian uh, military forces and the weakness of the Russian military. Uh, he's now gone into this conscript conscription uh, thing and it's very unpopular in Russia. If you look at the, uh, if you look at your TV and read your newspapers, you can see where over 200,000 uh, uh, military age men in Russia have left the country. So there's a hell of a drain there. It's an unpopular thing. So far, the body bags haven't started coming back because they've, they've covered it up with the, the losses they've already uh, suffered in Ukraine. And when these conscripts get there, they're not particularly well trained. They have a, they're, being, they're being called up and then they're being sent to the military into the front in Ukraine with only two weeks of training, which is practically nothing. So I don't see how this is going to succeed, 
But I, my, my own view is we ought to be very careful in the West to conclude that the war is over and that Ukraine has won the war. There's still a ways to go. Putin is desperate. He's, con he's cornered. He's obviously concerned. You know, I, I think back with Putin to uh, sometime maybe 2002, 2003, uh, a helicopter landed on this open field right out here uh, north of the Institute and Vladimir Putin got out and President Bush and I, President Bush 41 and I greeted him. He came here to the Institute. We, he gave a speech over there in Studi Hall. It was a wonderful speech about cooperation between the rest uh, and, the, and, the, and Russia, the Russian Federation. That's all gone, of course, and we're now in this uh, massive Cold War once again. People say, how should we fight this Cold War? And my answer to that is take a, take a lesson, take a page out of the playbook of the last Cold War we had. That was fought pretty effectively, and, but we're right back there. And not only that, we're back there with China, we're back in a Cold War with China as well. So there are a lot of issues around that that are gonna affect energy. Uh, but this has changed the, changed the chessboard. I don't know how it's going to end up. I don't think anybody could tell you definitively. I'm inclined to think at some point there'll be a, some sort of an agreed solution that would perhaps let Russia uh, save face by taking some parts of the Donbass. Uh, I think that that's not something we ought to support unless the Ukrainians come to us and say, this is what we want. And we ought to be steadfast in that and not let anybody think that we're going to support uh, a carving up of Ukraine. I remember being, uh, <laughs> being there at the, uh, present at the creation of Ukraine in 1991, and it was a very tense thing at that time. Ukraine wanted to declare independence. I was President 41, Secretary of State. We wanted to continue working with Gorbachev and Shevardnadze because we thought they were reformers and history proved that they were. Uh, and so we didn't want uh, Ukraine to, to trigger internal conflict in the Soviet Union at that particular time. So we dissuaded. We were, we counseled caution and so forth. I was also there when we, when we convinced the Ukrainians to give up their nuclear weapons, uh, which in retrospect, you could argue with. At the time, I'm totally convinced that was the absolute right thing to do in terms of the proliferation of nuclear weapons. We didn't want to have 13 nuclear weapon states coming out of the breakup of the Soviet Union. And as you all know, uh, we, uh, we negotiated something called the Budapest Memorandum at that time, where we all, uh, the UK, the US, and the uh, Soviet Union all agreed that if, right, that if Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, we would assure, not guarantee, but assure their security. And we, and we got commitments to that effect. Russia committed to that. That she wouldn't, that the, the four countries said, we won't attack you, we won't use nuclear weapons, and, but we won't guarantee your security. We will assure it. So the Budapest Memorandum, of course, is not, uh, Putin doesn't care anything about anything like that. And, and uh, here we are today. So how's it going to turn out? I cannot help but believe that at some point it, uh, they'll get to some sort of a negotiated solution that might give Russia an off-ramp of some kind. But again, I would, I, I would counsel against our being, letting anybody know that we favor that. I, I don't favor it. You're asking me where I think it might end up. That's where I think it might end up. Mr. Secretary, you've, you've dealt, as you referenced, with, with Putin uh, and his predecessors. If you were counseling the approach now to Vladimir Putin, 
specifically to Putin, what would it be? My approach today would be strength and resolve and determination. And I've been saying this now for about three or four years, maybe a little longer. Uh, as you know, because you were living it, uh, Russia has been out there buzzing our aircraft and buzzing our ships with their warplanes. And I've said for some time publicly, we should shoot one of those airplanes down. Russia is not a strong country, it's a weak country. It's got an economy that's half the size of California's or some percentage of size of California. And it's outrageous that we would sit back and let that happen with no consequences. So my, my view is dealing with Putin, he doesn't understand anything but strength, power, and resolve. I'm going to ask you a follow-up to that. In the previous discussion by the panel up here, a question was asked, if the war ends, will Europe go back to reliance on Russian energy? And the general judgment by the panel was not like it was in the past. What's your sense? Same thing. I don't think they'll go back to it, and maybe not even at all. <clears throat> I mean, they may, may continue to import some Russian energy, but they're not gonna let themselves be dependent upon it. And that's the only policy uh, that they ought to follow. They've learned what the cost of being dependent on Russian energy now is. That's why I refer to, I don't wanna get political here, but I will a little bit. <laughs> that's why I refer to our current energy policy, our domestic energy policy as schizophrenic. I mean, how in the world can you be worried about the fact that the price of energy is going up and you want to increase production, but you go to Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela to, to increase the production? How stupid is that? And you keep your foot on the neck, you keep your foot on the neck of the domestic energy industry, which only two years ago brought the United States to a position of independence to a position where we were net exporters of energy, which is a strong and important geopolitical strategic asset. So the policy today. I think, Mr. Secretary, the discussions of the past two days would bear out the, the schizophrenia that, that you point to. Yeah. But I have to ask the, the flip side of that yeah. question. Mm -hmm. If that's what is being advocated, how do you respond to the suggestion that this wipes out the possibility of energy transition? It doesn't just put it off, it eliminates it. Uh, how do you get to carbon neutral? All right, I don't, well, first of all, <laughs> I'm not a believer that we're gonna get to carbon neutral in the lifetimes of anybody in this room. Because when the lights go out and the room gets cold, you're gonna use fossil fuels. So the idea that you're gonna abruptly cut off, uh, stop using fossil fuels is, a, is ridiculous. If you believe that, I got a bridge in Florida, I wanna say, because that's not gonna happen. Uh, but I do think that we could transition to renewable energy in a, in a much more gradual and, and thoughtful and less disruptive way. But the, these ideas, you said, po political leaders set a date and said, uh huh, by this date we're gonna be uh, carbon neutral. And that, that doesn't work that way. So, uh, and, and furthermore, you gotta tell the climate warriors, warriors, and by the way, I think the climate is changing. Uh, and I do think that man has contributed some to it. I don't know how much. But you tell the climate warriors that uh, it's going to have to be a lot more gradual, that there can be a transition. There's nothing wrong with a transition. We ought to try and transition. But we ought to spend a lot of time trying to make sure that the major, that other, other major emitters are in there with us. Those other countries, I mean, India, China, Brazil, a lot of other countries, because whatever we do in this country is not gonna get us to carbon neutral 
globally. It's a global problem, not a, not a hemispheric problem. And on that subject of a global problem and China, that's our other big challenge. You identified a yeah, few minutes ago yeah, the, the yeah. Cold War yeah. with China as well. Where does that go? What's the best policy approach for the U.S. in dealing with China? Well, I, I, I get back to what I said about uh, a policy approach to dealing with Russia. Uh, when, you're in a, when you're in a war, whether it's a cold war or a hot war, you've got to show strength and resolve and determination. I think we need to show that with China. I'm one, I'm guilty on this. I was Treasury Secretary at a time, then Secretary of State, when we thought uh, if we brought China into the community of nations, that it might change her behavior, her domestic behavior. We were wrong. It didn't. She took, she, we, I worked hard to get her in the WTO. And, uh, and we got her in, and, and, uh, and what did she do once we got her in? She started screwing or continued screwing every country in the world out there on trade issues and not living up to her commitment. That's not right. And so I think that we, uh, you know, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, no, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. That's where we are with China, and I think we ought to be be resolute and uh, determined and strong. Do we exaggerate, do you think, the strength of Xi? Xi Jinping? The, yes. I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. It'd be interesting to see uh, one of those reports, those in, intelligence reports that you and I used to read on that issue. <laughs> be, it'd be interesting to see what our <laughs> intelligence community thinks. But I, I don't think so. I think the guy is pretty, He's pretty strong. You see the degree to which he's building up his military. He's, he feels free to uh, flex his muscles in the Taiwan Strait. He feels free to bully all of his neighbors in the South China Sea. I think he's pretty, pretty strong. Now, we've got a Politburo meeting coming up. I don't know, when is it? Soon. Soon. And that may give us some clues. But I think he's a pretty strong leader. And he's accumulating more and more power unto himself. Not least, I would add, because of Putin's weakening position. Correct. I can't help but believe <laughs> that Xi Jinping thinks he made a bad deal in that, in that alliance he, he created with Russia just a few days, before, a few weeks before the invasion. Then the invasion comes and the Ukrainians showed un, uh, uh, yeah, showed surprising strength, and we are in, we are where we are now. Xi Jinping must be thinking to himself, that wasn't a too good a deal I made, <laughs> exactly. which is a good thing. And, and another China question. You referenced the, the posturing, the swaggering um, in the Strait in, yeah, yeah. in South China Sea, East right, Asia. Right. Do you think this is power projection of a rhetorical, optical, character or is there a genuine intent to move militarily in the against, South China, Taiwan, against, against Taiwan? Taiwan. I, I do not know the answer to that and nobody knows it. I will say this, again I'm not being political, but I'm, uh, it saddens me to see the President of the United States come out here and say we're going to defend Taiwan if, if China invades. Oh really? You know what that involves? How many, law, how many wars have we lost in the last 20 years across the Pacific, or 30 years, or what? Two or three. And we're going to go all the way. Uh, we're going we're to join a land war all the way across the Pacific. I think it's important that we make it clear we're going to defend Taiwan within all the uh, means provided for by the Taiwan Relations Act and give them all the defensive military equipment and everything else they need. But I don't think a President of the United States ought to leave a, a policy formulation that's, been, that's worked, uh, that, that policy formulation being one of a strategic ambiguity where we won't say what we'll do. We need to keep the Chinese 
thinking about it, and I, I of course, I, I think we're fighting another war all the way across the Pacific. I'm not up there now, but if I was up there, I'd be arguing against it. That doesn't mean you we don't defend them, the, the Taiwanese politically, economically, diplomatically, and every other way, and providing military equipment. But when you talk about we're going to defend them if they're invaded by China, uh -huh. that's a very difficult situation for us. Mr. Secretary, you, you referenced the success we enjoyed as a result of the outcome of the Cold War, the classic Cold War. Yeah. That success depended on national consensus, bipartisan consensus, right. and strategic patience. Right. Do you see those elements present now? And, and if not, how, how do they come back? Huh. Well, that's how we cure, you're asking me how we cure the dysfunction in our politics in Washington, D.C. And if I knew that, I could make a lot of money. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I really don't. I mean, it's going to take, it's, we really need, it's one of the foremost problems facing our challenges facing our policymakers in Washington, our political dysfunction. The fact that we don't get the people's business done anymore. We send people up there and they have the luxury of not, have, not doing anything. They don't have to accomplish anything. All they got to do is show that they can fight the other side. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that, and we don't need to spend time today talking about them. One of them, of course, is the rise of the Internet, the fact that we're an evenly divided country, uh, the fact that people, the people we elect to Congress don't send their families up there anymore, so there's no socialization across party lines, uh, and, and the fact that the press are now players in our political debate. They, they don't want to see comity or agreement. They want to see uh, discord and divisiveness. So it's a real problem, and I don't know how we solve it. I am impressed, David, with the uh, unity that the country has shown around uh, aid to Ukraine. And I've said before, and I'll say again, I, I think that the administration has handled this Ukraine matter very adroitly and in very much the right way. I did a program with Secretary Blinken earlier this way up to February, I guess, in this year, uh, when they were first confronting it. And I think they've done a darn good job of walking that line between helping Ukraine and, and, uh, and not so antagonizing or confronting Russia that we somehow get drawn into that conflict. We, that's another conflict we don't need to get drawn into. Very good. So, Mr. Secretary, you end on a bit of an optimistic note mm -hmm. with respect to the unity that the Ukraine situation has mobilized, mm -hmm. yeah. concerns over the ability to handle a complex long-term policy challenge such as the energy transition, yeah. or a potential for a continued conflict in Ukraine that right. doesn't go away in the near term. Yeah. And how do you respond to that? China, a strategy of deliberate, and there's precedent for this, ambiguity about use of force. Strategic ambiguity Strategic on, ta on ambiguity. Taiwan. Well, on Taiwan, mm -hmm. but a position of engagement on the basis of firmness and strength. Right. As right. We, deal, we deal with Xi. With both of them, with both Russia and China. And, and I'm not suggesting necessarily strategic ambiguity in uh, you know, the Marshall Islands or some areas of the South China Sea, if China begins to get really militaristic and expansionist there. And I noted with great uh, interest an article uh, or so yet, yesterday or the day before in the, in the journal, Wall Street Journal, saying that we're increasing our uh, consultation with some of the Solomon Islands mm -hmm. where we spent, where we, where we uh, sacrificed so many American lives during the Second World War. And Europe and the U.S. transatlantic relationship, we come back now at the end to Isn't the bedrock of our policy. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting to see Vladimir Putin 
unifying the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in a way that no Western leader ever could have. I mean, that is really interesting <laughs> and good, plenty good. I think it's extraordinary. Yeah. And I think it is the bedrock as it was, as it will be yeah, for, for I, U.S. strategy and security. I agree, David, and I know you do, having been ambassador to Turkey, and you know how important that alliance is. And, uh, and it's, been, it's been revitalized, it really has. And this has been a, a very good warning uh, a shot to the Baltics, to Georgia, to uh, countries that are going to be next that would be next on Putin's list. Uh, but I'm hopeful that he has overreached so far and that the, that the unity of the West's opposition has been such that this will give him problems internally. I hope it does. I'm not naive enough to think we're there yet, but I think we could be there. We, I think we could get there. And I hope that's what happens. I'm going to take one final opportunity to ask you on a different topic. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Iran? Iran? And the state of the U.S. relationship, the mm -hmm. JCPOA issue? Well, I think it was a mistake, and this is not a political statement, to ever get into the negotiation with Iran about their nuclear weapons and not include within that negotiation their support for terrorism in the region and worldwide. The behaviors. Yeah, yes. Their behavior. Uh, but, but nevertheless, we are where we are. So I didn't, re I, I didn't uh, favor our unilaterally withdrawing. Mm -hmm. I think it was a mistake to get into that, uh, into that negotiation. I'm glad to see that it hadn't gone anywhere. Uh, I, th I think that by giving them all of them, by making a, a, uh, them able to achieve all this income that they achieved uh, as a consequence of, of negotiating that deal with them, we strengthen their ability to uh, engage in state-sponsored terrorism elsewhere. And I think that was sad and a mistake. So I hope, I hope the deal doesn't go any further. Now, that leads to the next question, which is a hell of a tough question. What do you do when they get the bomb? That's the question for you, David. <laughs> the answer to that is you have to continue to demonstrate the unacceptability of weaponization, much less the achievement of the bomb. I think the Iranian leadership at the highest levels knows that if weaponization were pursued, they would be found out. That there is no way they could conceal for long such a program. And that has to weigh heavily on their calculations. So you find it out, what do you do? You find it out, you provide a time limited, sort of like Tariq Aziz in those last days and weeks in the Gulf before War. the Gulf War began. Put a, put a timetable. You put a timetable up, you are explicit about what the consequences will be, which is you won't acquire the device. Mm -hmm. And then if you are challenged on it, you have to act. You have to pull the trigger right, if you yeah. show the gun. You never make a threat that you're not damn well ready to carry out. And that's what Obama made that mistake in drawing that red line in Syria and walking away from it. And see, that's why I have a problem with President Biden saying that we'll come to the defense of Taiwan, because that is an extraordinarily, dip, that's gonna be a very difficult thing for us to do. We, you, don't, you don't take territory by bombing it. You gotta have boots on the ground, and that means all the way across the Pacific. So I agree with you, by the way, that, that it, if, they, if they weaponize, and I don't know how you prevent that. They're getting damn close to weaponizing. If they weaponize, you say, okay, you're gonna get rid of that by such and such a date. I'm not sure our intelligence is gonna be real good on whether they've gotten rid of it or not. But then you do what needs to be done. But that's an, 
that's a, that's a difficult undertaking as well. It is indeed. The world's <laughs> not a simple place, <laughs> and, and not getting a simpler. Mr. Secretary, yeah. thank you. Thank you very David. much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to walk down with you. All right, so with that, uh, we have formally concluded the summit this year. Um, if anybody has any comments, suggestions, anything they want to share, always open to hear it. Um, we're going to be very busy, as you might imagine, uh, through this winter into next spring uh, for the foreseeable future, given everything that's going on and everything that was addressed today. Um, definitely look forward.